Ladies and gentlemen, we do have some pretty big news stories today, but before we get started, I have a very horrible and sad announcement to make, and it, it breaks my heart to say this. Earlier today, Roberto Jr. suffered a heart attack and he died instantly. And we're all very sad. Roberto Jr., for those that are familiar, is the rooster that we, we uh, uh, bred and raised. He was only just over two years old, and uh, we were kind of shocked by it. We knew that he may have been a little sick. We weren't entirely sure if anything was completely wrong with him, but he had been uh, acting a little bit more docile lately, and uh, he was having his feet cleaned, and he just had a heart attack and died. We attempted to perform, I kid you not, chicken CPR. We have uh, uh, oxygen. We tried giving him oxygen. Nothing worked. There seemed to be nothing we can do, and uh, we're all very heartbroken to, uh, to have to tell you, everybody, because as you know, we had a 95-foot-tall billboard of Roberto Jr. in Times Square. He is the mascot for our coffee brand. He is on our uh, Rise with Roberto Jr. breakfast blend. He is, the, he is the mascot for the entire coffee brand, and he is on our website as one of our cast members. And we, we treated him like the, uh, the main guy for Chicken City. He was the main guy. And we, we just, it just happened in an instant. Uh, I'm not the a foremost expert on chickens, but, uh, you know, we tried everything we could and there's not much you can do. Roberto Jr.'s mom died of cancer. And, uh, we knew that when he was, when he was born, he may have had some developmental issues, but he seemed like a, a good dude and he ended up having a bunch of kids himself. So he will be, uh, uh, he will be, his name will be carried on by Roberto the third, who has yet to been, uh, given the title, but, uh, in all seriousness, it is sad. We, we, we liked Roberto Jr. He was the, the, the king of the flock. And it's a sad report. So you can support uh, you can support us by going to Casper.com. You can buy Rise with Roberto Jr. He will be immortalized in this blend that we will keep. The, the king is returning. His father, Roberto, will be brought back to take care of his family in the meantime. And uh, sorry to everybody who's a fan of we, we even have emojis for Roberto Jr. So uh, that's the unfortunate uh, news. Uh, as for the actual news and moving on to the show, uh, again, rest in peace, Roberto Jr. You were too young. Andy No, he, he lost his trial against several uh, alleged Antifa members, I say alleged, because of the trial. The defense attorney proclaimed that they were Antifa, told the jurors that they would remember their faces, even though the jurors expressed fear that they would be targeted and doxxed by Antifa. I'm not surprised at the results. Andy No was mercilessly and brutally attacked on more than one occasion, but this is Portland we're talking about. Who in a jury would dare stand up to a known terror organization that goes around beating people, especially when you're at a trial where the man they beaten is saying, please help me. And they're looking at you saying, we won't forget what you've done. That's apparently what happens in this country. These people, I mean, are, are they going to be criminally charged? What's going to happen? However, even though Andy No lost, several of the defendants have been found in default. So there, there still may be a, a net benefit there for Andy. No, he may win in, in some respect. We got a bunch of other news, too. They're convening another grand jury, or I should say the same grand jury is convening in D.C., presumably to go after Giuliani or even bring more charges against Trump. And this one's massive, ladies and gentlemen. Anheuser-Busch has been forced to sell off several of its craft brands. That Anheuser- <laughs> They ain't doing too well. Before we get started, my friends, head over to castbrew.com to buy our coffee. You can see here, the immortal image of Roberto Jr. will never be forgotten. He is the main uh, personality behind our, behind our Rise with Roberto Jr. On the back of each bag is a picture of Roberto Jr., our rooster. Rest in peace. If you would like to uh, support us in this uh, grieving time, you can buy Rise with, Roberto, Rise with Roberto Jr. whole bean or ground. We have a bunch of other flavors. When you buy Casper Coffee, you're supporting the show. We really do uh, thank you all so much for your support and for buying the coffee. Sales have been pretty good. And we are going to be uh, hopefully launching our physical location sometime in October. Who knows? We're like a year delayed on everything. That's how it goes. But don't forget to head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. Become a member to support us directly. When you click join us, you can see there's Roberto Jr. We'll never forget you, buddy. We're going we're gonna to immortalize you and we'll build a little statue for you or something. Sad, sad days, man. Bucko is actually doing pretty well. It's just so brutal, man. Become a member and you can get access to our members only uncensored show, which will be up at 10 p.m. live tonight on the front page of TimCast.com. Not so family friendly. Don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe to this channel. Share the show with your friends. Joining us tonight to talk about this and so much more is Tom Fitton. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Who are Glad you, Glad to be back here. <clears throat> President of Judicial Watch, America's largest and number one most effective government watchdog group. We've been around, just celebrated our 29th year. Wow. 
So I've been, and, and, I've been there 25 years. And for this, uh, they made you testify in front of a grand jury. That's that's the uh, thanks. That's the thanks I get from the Justice Department. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely we'll talk about that with the grand jury convening once again in D.C. It'll be interesting. Yeah. So uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, we got Clint. He's back. I'm back. Uh, Clint Russell, host of Liberty Lockdown, co-host of Tower Gang, Mises Caucus, LP National member, and just thrilled to share the stage with the great Tom Fitton tonight. Oh, that's nice. Thanks. Phil is here, of course. How you doing? I'm Phil Abonte, lead singer of All That Remains, anti-communist and counter-revolutionary. Hi, buddy. Hey, buddy. Good to see you too, Phil. Hey, everyone. Ian Crossland, happy to be back. Give me some F's in chat for the chicken. I feel bad. I actually stood with him after he had died do you think is it was it still him when after they die is it still is it still him or is he gone now and it's just he was such a chill dude we raised him so he was super chill around people he was he was never scared yeah you could walk into the coop he'd just look up at you and walk around because we used to hold him in our hands he was he was born in front of us and then we we, we actually raised him indoors and then he became the, the the king of the coop displacing his dad roberto and uh this was just completely shocking when when uh, Kim was going to wash his feet because he's covered in muck and she's carrying him. He was totally fine. And then after she was done done washing his feet, he just all of a sudden goes Bleh! and then died just like that. That was rough. He uh, wasn't like it just. Yeah, just completely shocking. We, we've we've had to clean a bunch of the chickens when they get mucky and really, really filthy and they've got stuck stuff stuck to their butts and stuff like you that. You gave them know? a great life, Kim. Thank you. And thank you for doing everything for those chickens that you're doing and all the animals around here. It was really beautiful great. watching them try to resuscitate. I was we, like, this is love right here. We have oxygen canisters for like sports oxygen. And Kim, you know, put it in his mouth and tried giving him CPR. And we looked online and everything. We just did nothing we could do. Well, mad love, Roberto Jr. I'll see you again someday. Hey, let's get this story started. Are you going to have a burial or something? I think we'll figure something out. You know, his dad's coming back. So fortunately, That's Roberto's raw. still around. He's got a bunch of brothers, but, you know, Roberto Jr. was the heir to the throne. Roberto's going to come back and be like, you had one job, son. One well, job. he's got grandkids and Roberto Jr. has a couple sons. After so. Roberto Jr. had passed away, we had him outside. I mean, everyone was standing around like, well, I guess he's gone. And, and then all the chickens, I don't know if it's all of them, but a yeah. bunch of them came out of the coop and all lined up along the fence. And, and started like, squawking. Yeah. And the roosters were screaming no, for, real. for like an hour. It, it actually happened. <laughs> yeah. I, I was totally serious. I was there. I wouldn't believe it if I hadn't been there. I saw it happen. They, they, they like lined up. To, so there's like, there's the chicken coop. And then if you open the door, there's just thin fencing. So the chickens can go out in the grass. And they were doing their thing. And then at some point, I think one of the, one of the chickens realized, I don't know. I don't know what chickens think, but they were just doing their thing while we were trying to resuscitate Roberto Jr. And then all of a sudden the chickens started lining up, looking towards where Roberto Jr. was laying by the patio. And then they started all squawking. And the roosters were, were crowing for like a couple hours after that, or at least an hour and a half. All of them, I think. I don't know how many were out there, but it was a bunch of different ones. We're all doing their crows. They were yelling, the kings died. Do they react if another bird is injured? You, typically they kill them and eat them. Oh, so maybe they were hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, finally, that son of a bitch is gone. Tastes, tastes like chicken. Yeah, tastes yeah. like chicken. Yeah. yeah, Junior was rough on the ladies, but he was known, known for his greatness. The chickens but, are not known for their intelligence. R Roberto Junior is, you know, when he, he, had a, he had a bent toe when he was born, which is a sign of mal like malnutrition, malnourishment. Like, With, it was, egg, yeah. well, his mom, I think he was like one of the first eggs she laid, maybe. So I'm not entirely sure. But he also had an issue with, he had a respiratory issue. We knew about when he would crow. When he first started learning to crow, he would pass out. And so we were we were worried he had some circulatory problems. Interesting. So, you know, we did what we could. But anyway, we got Serge hanging out. Yeah. Rest in peace, my chicken friend. I apologize for, uh, I guess, not being more of a friend to you. I didn't know him very well. But yeah, happy he's uh, he's in a better place. Let's hope that. Yeah. Well, now his his name will be carried on by his children. You have an opportunity to get to know the other 50 that are out there, the unnamed. <laughs> The unwashed masses. <laughs> well, there's gonna be there's gonna be a Roberto the Third. You know, so we're, we, someone's gonna be named his heir. Dude, I gotta say, Luke is the man. He looks like a dog, like a fluffy, like <laughs> little, one of those little, Pomeranians. Little Luke is a rooster. <laughs> yeah, and he's named Little Luke because he's a Polish rooster, and the Polish roosters have blonde parted feather hair and big noses. <laughs> And so Luke was like, hey, he looks like me. He's got blind hair and a big nose. And we're like, we're going to call him Luke. That's wild. <laughs> and he's Polish. All right, let's jump to this first story. We got this from the Post Millennial. Breaking Portland jury finds Antifa militants not liable in Andy No attack. Defense attorney declares, I am Antifa. The defendant's attorney told the jurors their faces will be remembered. I want to show you this tweet. 
Uh, so this is the postman that says Andy No was harassed this morning on his way into court by alleged members of Antifa. The jury told the judge that they are concerned about being doxxed and said that people are trying to find out who they are. This is the current state of American politics in these cities. You have a defense attorney who tells the jurors, I will, here, here you go, Bur Burroughs told the jurors that she will remember each one of their faces. Burroughs not take the time to provide evidence as to why the two defendants should be free from charges, but rather use the time to defend anti-fascism and attack No's credibility as a journalist. So the trial, for those that are, uh, 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 are not familiar, is these alleged Antifa members who had assisted in, one, in the brutal attack outside of a hotel, had uh, provided support to other, other individuals who are accused of, of violently attacking him, and one of the individuals admitted to actually physically attacking Andy No on one occasion. The jury reached a verdict in the case of Andy No versus Rose City Antifa, in which they found both defendants, John Colin Hacker and Elizabeth Renee Richter, not liable in the civil case brought against them. Now, I will say, I don't know the full details of, you know, how everything was laid out, but I will call out absolutely when you have a defense attorney telling the jurors who are terrified of Antifa that they're going to remember their faces. Is that during the trial? Yes. That's got to be juror intimidation. I thought Antifa was a, an idea. Uh, but it that's turns out this idea has attorneys. Well, that's the argument they made. They made that we're not part of an organization. We are just anti-fascists. You know, we, we had sued. Uh, we had tried to get documents about an Antifa member who was, uh, I guess, had beaten up someone. And she was a teacher. So we wanted documents about what was going on at the school. And, and Antifa intervened. Uh, they had lawyers. We spent a lot of time fighting. And she got sanctioned uh, for doing this. And, and not only is it obviously an organization uh but on top of this defense lawyer doing something which is exceedingly improper i, I don't understand how you know could got, could have gotten a fair trial here you had remember they had to clear the courtroom the court stopped letting the public in because antifa was showing up and engaging in violent outbursts so you know would you what would you do if you were a juror you'd probably think you know i got a wife and family i got kids at home or whatever I'm getting out of here and uh, finding them, you know, not guilty or or not liable is what, an easy way out. What do you do in the case where it does appear that there's intentional uh, juror intimidation? What do you do if a judge isn't doing their job and intervening to defend them? Like what happens in that case? You know, I'm no lawyer, but uh, my guess is there there could be something you would could appeal here. Mm. that there was improper, uh, you know, he didn't get a proper trial given the threats of violence directed at the jury and the, and the disruption of the court, which yeah. which obstructs justice as well. It's an interesting case. It seemed to me a straightforward, you know, assault case. I'm not quite sure why the jury found the is, way he is did. Is this but, the same? You know, it could, there could be, you know, the, the, the liability as to how the jury had, what the jury had to decide, you know, maybe maybe they made the right decision, but uh, no way is, was the the appearance of a fair trial here. I see. So this, this, this civil order could have been like, it was a mob, it was chaos, he got attacked in the middle of the chaos, nobody intended for any of it kind of meant You know, maybe there was enough distance from the, you know, actual assaults that they could say I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't involved directly and the jury could have bought that. You know, but that's assuming that the justice was fairly administered in the courtroom and not compromised by the implicit threats of the attorney and the actual threats of the violent outbursts of Antifa members who were showing up in the court, it became so severe that the court had to stop the public from gaining access to the courtroom other than, I think other than media were allowed in. Wow. So when was that? How far through the trial did they start showing up and disrupting? I mean, this all occurred within the last week, week, uh, you know, week, seven, eight days, right? That's when I started reading about it. Yeah. yeah. That's jury intimidation also. How long has yeah. his, uh, his trial's been going on since like at least July 31st, I think, because Kay Katie Daviscourt from uh, Post Millennial is uh, covering it, and her it looks like she started on like the 31st is when the trial started, I think. Dude, I, there's no way I can wrap my head around this. I mean, I'm getting this from the Post Millennial, which, you know, full disclosure, Andy No works for, I think he might be part owner yeah. of the company or something, but I don't know, maybe he's not owner. Um that it's it's almost like too bizarre like the the prosecuting attorney says to the jury i'll remember all of your faces as if the jury's not going to crap themselves and be like what do i have to do for her not to come after me later like it's, what it's, did i do wrong but but it's also the facts of the case andy no being like here's a video of me being mercilessly beaten in the street on more than one occasion 
Here's a guy who admitted to attacking me in a gym. I need help. Then the defense attorney looks at the jurors and says, I'll remember all of your faces. And they're like, oh, the defense attorney. Yes, yes. Not the, the def prosecutor. The, the defense, attorney, defense attorney. Then all then the, the jurors are watching these people mercilessly beat innocent people. And that's not in question. We watch them do it on camera. And then the jurors are told, we will never forget what you do this day. The jurors are basically thinking to themselves, I don't have anything to do with this. But they're cowards. That's that's about it. Cowardice. I, I, I'm just like, maybe we need artificial intelligence juries. <laughs> I can't take it anymore, this this juror tampering crap. Nah, but, arti but, artificial intelligence juries are not going to weigh justice. They're going to weigh- be hacked. It, no, they're going to weigh ease of ease of access. But is it is it cowardice? Because if you can't get a fair trial and you're living in Portland, it seems like it would almost be the prudent decision to make to just be like, look, I think that they're probably guilty, but I don't want to have to- That's yeah, cowardice. Well, I, it's cowardly, but also what, it's what, prudent. Yeah. Is it not? Like- would you? No, it's not. Well, was the jury short, was short the, term gains? You, you're sacrificing your future, your neighbor's future, your children's future for what? A few moments of. Well, I'll put it this way: those who would give up essential liberties for freedom for secu for a small amount of security right. deserve neither, and will lose both. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's fair, but I, I'm saying. If you're in a position where you're already not able to get a fair trial in a case like this, it's kind of just time to leave. It's I agree. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who say, like, I can't leave. I have kids and I can understand and respect that. And I respect people saying, I'm going to stay here and try and push back. But if you're on this jury. Yeah, you should still cast the proper vote. I agree. Yeah. Don't be a coward. Yeah. You know, and I then think, if you're going to leave anyway, be like, nah, I'm going to find him liable. I'm going to get get out. Look at this. Donald Trump's found liable for an, for an, for a sexual assault. 30 years ago in the biggest department store in the country, in, in, this, in the country, probably where nobody saw him. The most famous guy in New York walks in a building. None of the story makes up, makes sense. And these people in New York are like, yeah, screw it. He's liable. And then Andy Noah is on camera being chased and beaten by people. And they're like, nah, not these guys. One of the guys outright said, yeah, I was at a gym. I poured water on him and hit his phone out of his hand. And they're like, nah, you're fine. Crazy. But Donald Trump. Oh, you got it. You got to You got to get him. You know, my view is that uh, were the, was the jury sufficiently protected given the fact that Antifa is a terrorist organization? Apparently and, they said and, they were terrorists. And if Al-Qaeda was in a trial or right. a terrorist group was in a trial, I think there would be a lot more security and protection for the jury and less tolerance from the court. But Antifa, we've been told time and time again, is, quote, anti-fascist and, you know, they're doing the Lord's work when, in fact, uh, you know, they're, they're communist revolutionaries that kill people. And 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 um, beat them up if they get in the way, and uh, so I don't I don't see how Andy got a fair trial here. Uh, you know, we can argue about whether the jury should have found guilty, uh, you know, liable or not liable, but in the end, that result has been compromised, and you can't trust the results. So there, we'll see what happens. If there's you can't. I don't think you can trust. Uh, I mean, it, it's difficult for people to to trust the courts at all nowadays. I think. You know, whether it be Andy's situation or the police officer that just got sentenced to whatever, five years or four years of yeah. prison for, for just being on the scene of the uh, the George George Floyd uh, situation. Just yeah. just for being there, he got he got charged. And, and I honestly so, wasn't at all certain that the Rittenhouse case was going to go the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, know, I, I don't I don't have any. Thankfully, faith. I'm, thankfully, you're, I agree. I don't have any faith either. But but yeah, I mean, the, there have been a lot. There are so many court cases that have gone the wrong way like especially in the past you know five years or so and i think that it's likely that he, that trump is going to be found guilty on something i think with all the all the stuff that uh, he's gonna be found guilty on all that, of it well i mean fair enough but you know so and they're all real thin charges so i i, I don't have a whole lot of Faith in, ju in the judicial judicial system if, anymore. If, if he's found guilty on all of them, Tim, do you think we actually see Donald Trump in prison? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I give me a scenario where Trump is not going to prison. What do you What do you think, Tom? Um, I think the odds are significant. I don't think it's they're they're over fifty that he's found guilty and and, you, and you, is you, sentenced to prison. Whether he goes to prison or not. I, I think that would be pretty extraordinary. And certainly it's not, I don't think it's going to happen before the election, although up in D.C. here, uh, I think that judge is angling to get that trial done before the end of the year. So I, th I think it's fair to say it's unprecedented and perhaps there will be a house arrest circumstance or something to that effect. Yeah. He's with Secret Service. He'll be confined to Mar-a-Lago. Who knows? I think that proves it's BS. 
right? Any anybody who's convicted of trying to overthrow the United States, the United States government, would would face very very extreme and severe charges, like remand in a military detention facility. <laughs> right. Donald Trump is like, you're free to go. You know, we'll see about it because all they're trying to do is jam up his his chance at re-election. Yeah, and they don't want to piss off his followers because if they did put him in jail without charge or trial, you'd have people on the street breaking stuff at the moment. Well, that that's what I'm so concerned about is like I tend to agree with Tim that the prosecution and the conviction, in my opinion, seems more likely than not. But I can't envision what America and his supporters look like and react with if that transpires, either before or after the election. I don't know what I don't know what this country looks like. You could see like Vivek Ramaswamy step in and take it the lead and win the presidency and pardon him. But oh, that's big, interesting. Big ask, yeah. Or big. or he could win the presidency and pardon himself from jail. Yeah. You never know. Joe Biden could theoretically pardon himself yeah. on all these accusations against or him. Or the as next well. Democrat, if it's Gavin Newsom, he comes in, he's like the great he wants to be the great unifier, he pardons everybody. <laughs> oh, that ain't happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gavin Newsom is you not gonna He'd piss me. off so many people. There is no way. Gavin Newsom <laughs> will pardon the Democrats and then send his, the DOJ after every Republican. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Because you well, yeah. once you become the president, you want the Republicans on your side, even if you're a Democrat. No, th- what 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 makes do you feel like Joe Biden has No, wants? he's been terrible at it. He he's just I don't. Did he you never feel really, like Barack Obama did? A little bit, really. In the beginning, he seemed to care about everybody, and then all at some point he got partisan. Ian, and, we're we're in the we're in the conquest stage of empire decline. I don't think that these people are going to be looking to reach across the aisle like the days of bipartisanship. I fear have sailed. But conquest, as in the United States, is going to take over other countries. No, conquest. no, no. I just mean political conquest, where it's like we're going to control the the you know the reins, and we're going to beat the hell out of our opponents. And that's that's kind of see, seems what it is like. It, it just it just ping pongs back and forth, but it's just about conquest. And well, I, I used to not use the term communist too much in discussing the political opposition in this country. But I mean, there is this rising communist approach, and I don't mean literally communist, but in the sense that the rules don't matter to us, and if we're in control of the uh, as, you know the tools of power. We're going to do whatever we want. They're, they're literally communists. Yeah, I think yeah. Canada they, has a communist they, party. In they it. are communists, well, but at, at the risk of sounding like Jordan Peterson, it's a lot of postmodernism in the way that they approach political, uh, you know, dialogue or, or the way they approach politics. There's there's a lot of people that are making criticisms of what was it the the most recent one. Um, they, it's just very frequently the the left tries to get people to be quote unquote held to their own standard, mm-hmm. but they don't have a standard of their own, and that's by you know that's that's because of the fact that they don't fundamentally believe in liberal principles. They, like they're they are a counter enlight they have a counter enlightenment philosophy. So like they don't believe that you can reason. They don't believe that you can actually even have contact with reality. They believe that our perception is is too color by our our experiences to to ever really know what's true or real just so if no one can know what's true or real then you can never actually engage in dialogue from a a place of honesty you know just yeah. just a couple yeah. just a couple weeks ago there was the uh, the rfk censorship hearings and you had a bunch of democrat politicians that were up there uh, congress members i believe and they were just they were genuinely argue, arguing in favor of censorship because they're like we have to prevent disinformation. Yeah. We were looking out for you. This was all good. And I'm just like, you're liberals? That it's compl- like, entirely illiberal. And it, it, unbelievable. Goes, it goes completely and totally against every everybody over 40 years old when they think of a liberal right. they think of people that are actually liberal that would be like against censorship and want you know government agencies would all like approach the problem looking to have a positive result and i don't think that you can do that so much nowadays and i think that's because the people that are in posi- in congress frequently have again a, a different uh, philosophy, a different worldview. They're not liberals, and that matters. We talked about this last week that Marxism is a path to communism, and so is technocracy. And I think a lot of people have been twisted by the technocratic nature of reality in the last 20 years with the internet and with social media and with uh, spying that now they're just going the direction towards communism because they think that they cannot govern without it. It has to be more control. And like Canada has of their four largest political parties, the Communist Party of Canada is one of the four. They're blatantly, just because you call your political party the Democratic Party doesn't mean you're not all communist. You can be communist and call your party whatever you want. Well, so yes, you can have me, many communists in government. I want to pull up this story here. This is from The Recount. Minneapolis judge sentenced Tao Tao, a former police officer who held back bystanders as other officers pinned George Floyd to the ground to four years and nine months in state prison. I look at this judge 
and I see a deeply, deeply evil individual. This cop, Tao Tao, probably pronouncing his name wrong because there's some nuance to, this, to that name. It's T-O-U-T-H-A-O. He's 37 years old. He's a nine-year veteran of the force. He arrives on scene, and all he did was hold back bystanders. And I don't believe he could even see what was going on or knew what was going on. He's gotten, I think, three years in prison at the federal level, and now just about five more years at the state level. Wow. This is it. If well, you go against the regime, or actually if you accidentally go at, go against them, they just destroy your life. Yeah. You know, the, this this racialism, I think, I think of it like this black hole theory of, of politics and justice and such. It's like racialism, politics, you know, it, it's like a black hole and, and it distorts everything around it, including the justice system. And I, I don't see how, how, you know, you know, I know how we're all supposed to think about the Floyd verdicts, but I don't see how anyone could look at those Floyd verdicts and think, well, that was justice in the sense that the jury operated honestly and dispassionately without pressure again, of violence, and we forget about that part of this scenario, and just kind of what people understood about Floyd's uh, situation at the time, and the obvious, and the training that the police officers had, that they seemingly were trying to follow. You know, I didn't, I didn't support the verdict. It was, you know, you don't want to see someone die necessarily, uh, but certainly in my view, was it, it wasn't murder, well, he, or anything he, close to it. Here's where I go crazy. This Tao Tao gentleman, he was basically responsible for holding back the crowd while these other officers kneeled on him. And sure, maybe he didn't do everything perfect and maybe ultimately he could have prevented it. I don't know. What what drives me crazy is that this guy, even though he's not really culpable, I think if you're evaluating this fairly, he's not truly culpable for the passing of George Floyd, but he's going to do maybe eight years. But then you have the the murderer of Daniel Shaver in Arizona, which if you watch that video, it's one of the most egregious cop killings that has ever transpired in American history, as far as I'm concerned. And he walks free. Better than that, he also gets a, a pension for his psychological damage from and doing so what he did. This is the guy who was told to crawl on the ground? Yes. Yep. Simon says execution. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know much about that. When did this? There was a guy in a hotel room and he had a pellet gun because he was a pest exterminator. Someone called into the police and said they saw someone with a gun. So these cops show up, scream at him with rifles pointed, saying on the ground, put your hands up, put your hands down, crawl toward me, crawl towards me. Now put your hands up. Now crawl towards me. Now put your hands up. When the guy's pants start falling down and he pulls them up, the oh, cop geez. just unloads on him. He was he was drunk. He had his shirt off and he was wearing sweatpants at the time. He was in a, in a hotel and they had him on his knees. And so as he's crawling towards them with his hands up, his the the his knees are dragging and pulling his pants down, his sweats down. So he goes and he reaches down to pull them up and while crying. Yeah, yeah, crying. And the cop just unloads on him. Terrified. He, he was horrified. Yeah. This Dan, uh, this uh, George Floyd thing, I think it's another example of how technocracy is leading us to to communism. Because what happens is the media chooses what clips get shared over and over and over again, True. and what can't be shared. I the, tried to whoa, talk whoa, about whoa. the, the fentanyl, media. The media. Yeah. You mean we'll say Facebook. social media algorithms? Yeah. Meta, yeah. meta, for instance, <laughs> censored my yeah, posts yeah. trying to talk about the fentanyl in his system. The guy was doing an eight ball or what a speed against ball against the rules. It takes behind the wheel of a car. So like the media that got pushed out was the few minutes that he can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. People go crazy, and then the the cops. The job of the law enforcement is like protect the peace. They don't care about who's guilty or innocent. They don't want riots. Well, yes. So they yep. That's right. This 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 tau tau is going to prison because they just want to avoid more social yes. breakdown. That means. Understand this. If you live in a city like Minneapolis, if you live in a city like Portland or Seattle, and you are an, a victim of violent crime from the likes of a far left extremist or even just a run of the mill criminal, you could be the victim and there is no out for you. You fight back. You go to jail. You try and stop the criminals. You go to jail, just like the guys in the Ahmed Arbery case. You cower in the corner of your house as people scream outside. The cops go into your home and they arrest you. That's what we've been seeing happen. And of course, it's the black community in Minneapolis who suffer the most here uh, because the police have been decimated there. Uh, they, they have virtual no protection from the police anymore. And so, you know, now we're ve veering towards anarchy in our major cities uh, as a result of the soft on crime policies resulting or where, well, not resulting from where the Floyd ki killing was used as an excuse to advance this radical agenda of decriminalization of everything. They don't believe in putting anyone in prison for any reason. Yeah. 
You know, it's not they just don't oppose well, the death my, penalty. They don't want anyone in jail. One, and when you think the whole system's corrupt, all jails are corrupt, and no one should go to them. One, this one, is a radical approach that's get, kill, getting people killed right now as we speak. Well, one one minor clarification: it really is specifically di- dictionary definition anarcho tyranny because not only are they not enforcing violent crime laws, but they also disarm the people, so they can't even defend themselves. So on both ends of it, you're basically just set up to be a victim. And then that's, is that because from the leader's perspective, if you have one class violating another class and then the other class decides to fight back, now you've got two classes of villains and you can arrest them all. The criminals destabilize the system and keep people in a, in a state of constant fear and chaos, unable to take any actions against the power structure. So long as there are people at the bottom fighting each other, the people in power right, are Because are we need grassroots movements to t- control the the top. That's the whole point of the United States is the people control the government. If the people are fighting each other, they're not going to be able to rein in that power structure. I'm just concerned well, I, that what Clint was saying, that the ship has sailed uh, and the empire is now in the conquest. I, 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 I think yeah. like throughout history, what we have seen and what we've seen in our media depicting potentialities of revolution, I'm reminded of the scene from V for Vendetta where the, narr- the inspector is narrating. He says, eventually someone does something stupid. It then shows the police officer, the finger man, shoot the little girl wearing the mask. And then all the locals just surround him with baseball bats, pipes and crowbars. And then the camera pans up and the assumption is they beat him to death. When you get to a point where police officers are going to prison for literally doing nothing, when you've got stories of people who on January 6th were walking around confused. I, I, I learned this story just recently of a woman who I met. And she said that it was a few hours after the Capitol had been breached. They were walking around D.C. and they walked to the Capitol with nothing going on. There's no people. There's like people walking around. There's no cops. There's no barricades. No one's saying anything. They walked up looking around and then left for misdemeanor charges. We should have her on the a show. A year and a half in jail. I was thinking we should have her on the show. I don't know how prudent it is to have someone on the show that's facing January at, 6th at, charges, but that story needs to be well, told. A, a, an, an interview, perhaps. But the question is. At what point do regular people say there isn't a justice system? I'm getting and, there. And, and I want to no, clarify like this. Like the reason why the founding fathers thought innocent until proven guilty was so important was not because they like you. Uh, partly because they like you and they're good Christians, God-fearing people who believed in individuality and rights. But no, 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 no. There was something greater that the founding fathers talked about. If people believe that, no, that if no matter what they do, the government will punish or imprison them, then they have no incentive to be law-abiding citizens. If a criminal is treated all the same as an innocent person, then screw it. But if the system says we protect you if you're innocent, then there is every incentive for the individual to be an innocent person, knowing that we'll fight on your behalf. But that's changing now with what this judge has done, with what they're doing in January 6th. They are telling the people, no matter what you do, we will punish you. No matter if you're innocent, confused, ignorant or otherwise. If you are at your house in Milwaukee and BLM shows up screaming and threatening you, a group that had previously set fire to a house twice. The cops will come into your home and arrest you. That actually happened. Fair point. The guy living in the house brandished a shotgun through the window, not out the window, but up to the glass of his window. He showed the people protesting. He was armed. So the police came, went into his house and arrested him. And the BLM activists cheered for it. These are people who had previously been at a house that they set on fire twice. Yeah. Yeah. The guy that the guy that got arrested his house was set on fire two no, 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 times no. okay right. blm right. shows up a right. uh, uh, blm affiliated activists essentially formed a mob showed up to a house where they believed two girls had been illegally held it was not true they set fire to the house the fire department puts the fire out they leave the mob sets fire again fire department puts the fire out that same group similar group organized by similar people show up to the house of a guy who had criticized black lives matter screaming and protesting in front of his home in front of his window, he brandishes a shotgun in his own house. They call the police. They brandished a weapon. The cops walk up to his house and arrest him from in his own home. Wow. It is easier to arrest you, the target of the mob, than it is to deal with a riot. Yeah. I was watching uh, these comments, some of them. And, I, you know, when we talk about this stuff, I get this is the black pill. I can take it. I don't necessarily get black pilled. I can handle a little bit of it. I'm like, where is the I'm, I'm war gaming this. Where does it go? Revolution an upheaval and an overturning of the U.S. government to something that will never be nearly as good as U.S. government. We have it no. so good right now. Yeah. This I, is, what were you going to say, Tom? I, I, think, I think our republic is tottering again. I, th- I think, you know, if Trump is jailed and is unable to, to campaign or effectively has the election 
turned against them because of this jailing. Uh, you know, there's not going to be riots. There's not going to be mass demonstrations. There's just going to be concern. And, you know, the Constitution will have been left behind. We'll be in a post-constitutional system where uh, American citizens who are on the wrong side of uh, the Democratic Party, and this, I, I don't like to get partisan, but it's true. This is the Democratic Party using the Justice Department to jail their political opponents. And there are a lot of Americans who aren't going to, you know, participate in the system, our political system, if they fear that they're going to get jailed. I think one of the ugly undersides of the indictment of Trump is is Smith's targeting of citizens in the several states who were, best they understood under the law, trying to challenge an election and in a way that had been done many times before that could seemingly comply with federal, state, and constitutional law. And he's suggesting they were engaged in criminal conspiracy. So that's a signal. Don't, don't, don't challenge any elections that we're, 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 we've won, so to speak. Otherwise, you'll get in jail. But now, some people yours. are going to say no, and they will continue to, but a lot will, 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 will stay, out of the, stay out of the game. I want to jump to this story from the Daily Mail. We're talking about anarcho-tyranny. We're talking about the, the justice system no longer uh, bringing justice. Innocent people being locked up and the machine being weaponized against uh, uh, it's, uh, the Democrats weaponizing the system against political opponents. But here's what I think could actually lead to an actual revolution or civil war. Moody's cuts credit ratings of 10 U.S. banks and warns six more could face a similar fate. But firm insists U.S. banking system is not broken. This is uh, disconcerting considering what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and several other banks uh, earlier this year. But we also have this from TimCast.com. U.S. credit card debt hits record $1 trillion. Total U.S. household debt top $17 trillion as Americans turn to debt to cover living expenses. Do you know what the one thing, there, there's a few things that precipitate civil war and revolution. You know what the simplest is? The most obvious and simplest catalyst for governmental breakdown? Inflation would be my guess. No food. Oh, run out of food. Yeah. When people are unable to buy food, we saw it in the Arab Spring. You see it in the French Revolution. It's not absolute, but typically when people struggle to make ends meet, they become angry and desperate. And when they're hungry, nothing else matters. So right now, maybe it's a little preliminary. We're seeing we're seeing corporate and governmental collapse. We're seeing our institutions decay. We're seeing the judicial system decay. We're seeing the Democrats weaponize government against their political rivals. I will say this with absolute certainty that Democrats are cheating in the 2024 election. And what I mean by that is not that there's fraud or they're doing any weird ballot stuff. What they're doing is fairly obvious. They're literally arresting and criminally charging their political opponents. A fair and honest election is when three times they've done it three times. That's already. right. <laughs> a fair or next week. A fair and honest election is when you say, choose me. I'm the best. Don't choose him. He's bad. And the other guy says the same thing. Then people will decide. That's a fair and honest election. What they're doing now is saying we can't win. So lock him up and prevent him and hobble him in any way possible. That's cheating. Yeah. When you yeah. when you take all that into consideration with the fact that our financial system is whacked out of proportion, it, there really is a substantial risk with everything going on. And there have been food shortages, especially with COVID and everything, that if the monetary system faces severe turmoil, people can't find houses to live in. People can't afford to pay rent. People can't afford to buy food. You add that into the mix with all the political turmoil and then something kicks off. Yeah, I mean, not only that, but also there's the concern about inflation and stuff like that, because right now the, the dollar is only backed by confidence in, in the government and stuff. So we really do have a, a, a historic, historically volatile situation on our hands. We've got real, like, what is it, like... Uh, generation a couple generations or, or multiple generations since we've had economic inequality uh oh of this between, level yeah between yeah. The, the, this level and that's something whether or not it i mean i know that people's material like material poverty is, has gone down but if you've got a society where there's significant difference between the highest earners and the lowest earners and stuff you do get civil unrest and you get unhappy populations you've got You've got the changing of the the global order when it comes to monetary policy with BRICS and with other you know people starting to move away from the dollar. I, it's it's I don't see a whole lot of like positive things on the horizon. Let, let me let me double down on that real briefly. Sick, uh, thanks, man. Yeah, the the Federal Reserve <laughs> ha held the the federal funds rate at a quarter point for approximately a decade. 
since the the Great Recession. They're just like, we're just going to keep it at zero, the zero bound forever. There'll be no problems from that, right? And then we're going to print $5 trillion in the year 2020, and we're going to lock down the economy, create supply chain shortages, which also uh, add to the inflationary pressure. And then in a 12-month period starting in February of 2022... They're going to start to hike the Fed funds rate very aggressively, a half point every time they have a meeting. And they're going to take it from a quarter point up to approximately five and a half, six, which then takes the mortgage rates from three and a quarter and it puts it up to seven and a half, eight. It also makes it so that all of these T-bills and these uh, short-term debt instruments that are held on all of these banking institutions, they are now bleeding all over the floor. That's the whole reason that Moody's is marking them down, by the way. It is strictly a Federal Reserve created crisis crisis. I want to be very clear about that. This would not be happening. The American people would not be living off of credit cards and have a trillion dollars of debt if it weren't for inflation. That's why all of this is happening. What's- and let me add to that. Uh, it's This is all politics. You know, I, I'm surprised this doesn't happen sooner because an honest evaluation of the way our banks are regulated, the decider about whether a bank is solvent is a political appointee in the Biden administration. And so all these decisions are political. Uh, the the big uh, the what is it the Silicon Valley Bank that decision to shut that bank down was a political decision made as a result of lobbying by Democrats yes and then the bank here on the East Coast that was subsequently shut down signature signature that bank was perfectly fine uh, but the they didn't like the fact that they were in the business of crypto and they told them that and that's the reason they were shut down. We knew from the 2008 uh, uh, shutdowns because we got the documents, Judicial Watch did. They didn't know why they were shutting the banks down. They just didn't have a systematic way of of shutting banks down or or doling out financial support for the banks. It was, well, we want everyone uh, to get the support so no one knows who the bad banks are. So the good banks should get money and the bad banks should get money and we'll disguise who the bad banks are by making everyone else take the subsidy. It was completely political. The same goes with the Fitch knocking down our uh, credit rating here in the United States. It's politics. Yep. It's politics. We've got politicians who have decided that printing money is, and, and it's po- politicians of both parties, the best way they can stay in power is to print money. And they don't care what the consequences it's, it's are. And there's, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Transferring wealth. Uh, chicken and, in every pot. You know, and... Um, so on top of the increase in, as they were increasing interest rates, they kept the spigot flowing yes. in terms of spending at the at the government level. And, you know, there, there's no sign that it's going to be curtailed. No. It's not going to be curtailed. You know, so now we're all supposed to be excited. They've increased, uh, you know, they've cut down our salaries by 4 or 5%, practically speaking, our spending power over the last year. And- now we're supposed to be satisfied that we've lost that purchasing power, that they've been cemented, the, the prices have been cemented at a higher level. They're not getting lower. They're just not getting as high as quickly mm-hmm. as they previously did. So, you know, there's no easy way out for this. But there is, you know, other than curtailing government spending, taking politics out of the regulation of the banking industry, uh, meaning the government's got to get, you know, uh, spend a little less money trying to effectively uh, tell everyone that we will insure all deposits as right. opposed to making sure the banks that make bad decisions go to weigh the dodo bird. I keep thinking that maybe we could default on the debt to the Federal Reserve or at least the interest to the Federal Reserve and be like, you know, suck it. But that's like <laughs> telling the Swiss bank, the Bank for International Settlements, suck it. And when then they would they then excommunicate the United States from the liberal economic order? If we I, did something, I, I, probably I, I, it doesn't. It's not that hard. You just need to change the trajectory just a little bit. And for yeah. small government people, it's disappointing because we can spend a whole lot of money if we just change the trajectory. Not too much, as far as you know, conservatives would be. But in terms of like social security and government spending, just change the trajectory just well, a little bit, and it say and it, and it allows the government to spend money virtually world without end forever. Uh, but they don't even want to do that. Well, what's so frustrating is like literally a 10% cut across the board and we could balance the budget pretty quickly because they take in so much in tax receipts. And it's like, do you think that there's not 10% in excess spending in every federal department? Like, yeah. 
I'm sure there is. Just look at the war in Ukraine. Look at where all the, those billions are going. Like, you think they can't cut 50% of that and still get the same bang for their buck? It's just an absurdity. But I, I want to, like, really emphasize to the conservative audience that's listening right now, it's, inco- it's incumbent upon you guys to understand that it is Federal Reserve policy that is making it so challenging to have household formation, to get married, to have kids. All of these things that you guys consistently lament, you miss the biggest factor is that inflation has forced both parents into the workforce and it has made it incredibly and increasingly challenging to be a parent, to get married, to buy a home. All of these things are Federal Reserve policy. Uh, you know, oh, oh, yeah, but that, that's Only a, that's the government a, can do this type that's of That's a damage. large component <laughs> of it, but cultural issues. Of course, it's I think. very important too. Yes. It's hand in hand. I, I think cultural is the bigger those issue. Those central banks, well, they're, they're all kind of controlling and manipulating the media, which is manipulating the culture to because why are people not more up in arms about the federal reserve if they knew if you knew that that private bank was disrupting your life you would have taken it back 100 years ago i would hope if we did not ever have the revolution in the workplace women stayed at home it wouldn't matter what the federal reserve tried to do women would not but, but that coincides with the inception of the Federal Reserve. 1913, you have the women's right. liberation. They start to hit the workforce. I think it's all part and parcel of the same dynamic. I, sure, I, sure. I, but I mean, cult, the cultural change has to happen first. Maybe. I think I, I think they I think one chases the other. It's like it's not necessarily a yeah. World War One got people really really culturally messed up right after the Federal Reserve was ready to go. Yeah, like that. you got well, no nothing politicians sitting at the knobs trying to manage the economy. And they 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 don't know what they're doing, and things get out of whack now and again because they don't know what they're doing. I mean, I remember in two thousand eight, I read in the Wall Street Journal when they first started giving money to the way to the banks, the banks said to the Wall Street Journal, well, they didn't give us a choice. I said, well, isn't that interesting? So we sued, Judicial Watch sued for the records. Long story short, they said, we got the records. We want to meet with the top nine banks, bring them into the Treasury Department. And the chief of staff is like, okay, who were the top nine banks? So they didn't even know who the top nine banks were. So they bring them in, the heads of the top banks of the United States of America, and they said to them, we're going to, t- we're going to give you subsidy. And you should know that if you don't want to take it, we're going to make it so that your regulators require you to do so. And they made them sign little permission forms, two or three lines. I agree. I, Jamie Dimon, agree to take $12 billion, whatever, uh, you know, contingent on approval from the board of directors. That's how they, quote, bailed out the banks. And it was never a bailout. It's a takeover. Yeah. If you Every time you hear about bailing out banks, substitute the word takeover and you understand why we're in the state we are. You can watch The Big sh- uh, the big Short is a movie that uh, is really good that covers this kind of stuff, and also Too Big to Fail was another one. Too Big to Fail was kind of the crisis from the government's perspective, and The Big Short was like three or four different groups of people that actually kind of saw... The housing crisis coming and what it was, what it would do to the to the the whole economy. Well, um, but well, the, go ahead. Oh, you, just, actually, you know better than I do. You would. Go well, ahead. yeah. I, I mean, I was a mortgage lender, so I, I and I came out of college right into the teeth of that, and it was a nightmare. Um, and fortunately, you know, we've gotten past that. But there was actually a bailout with with Silicon and uh, and the other bank that I'm blanking on right now, uh, Signature in January of this year, and they created a very similar lending vehicle. People don't even know about this, but because of what I just described, where the Fed funds rate was escalated and they had all of these uh, you know, short-term debt, debt instruments that were ultimately upside down, they created if they created a, le- a short-term lending vehicle that was only on offer to banks that had... a. It was never given explicitly, but based off of my uh, analysis, it was any bank that had over $200 billion in uh, you know, cash on hand or deposits or money, money under management. And so basically what that means is that if you are banking with an institution that's midsize or massive, then your deposits north of $250,000 are insured. If you are banking and depositing with a bank that has less than $200 billion, so that's your mom and pop bank. Those are the banks that we would probably, us, like us people would like to, like to do business with. Now our deposits aren't insured with them. So what does that mean? It, it, it drives all of us in this room to make the calculation that it's actually more prudent for me to bank with this scumbag Jamie Dimon than it is to bank with this mom and pop down the street. That is that is a terrible mismanage, mismanagement of the economy, and it is not accidental. It is ultimately the reason that Mercola got debanked, the reason that the entire social credit score system is coming. They want us in the biggest banks because the biggest banks are willing to debank us if we don't go That's along right. with That's right. It's easier to control if you've only got five banks as opposed to 3,000 banks. What, what would you rather do as a dumb government regulator who wants to tell everyone to do? So, Clint, well then, what would you what would you say is the best 
option for people to stay away from, to continue to, to move away from the bigger banks and, and do the, do your best to stay in credit, yeah. uh, like credit unions and stuff like that? I, I mean, the the issue is if you're a, a mid-sized because, and, business that has more than $250,000 that you'd like to put in a bank, I can't in good conscience tell you to put that into a smaller bank because if we end up in a crisis period, there's yeah. a very good chance that you will have your assets frozen. You won't be able to receive them. Now, you can just diversify, you can put that into other accounts. But the, the tragedy is that you have all of these these uh, startup companies that are more conservative leaning that are trying to compete with these Goliaths. And they now have to do business with their enemies, which is the Bank of America, the JP Morgan Chase. Um, it's just not it's just not a good footing for our ability to fight back. And I don't think it's I don't think it's an accident. I want to talk about this story from CNN. D.C. grand jury that handed up 2020 election indictment against Trump meets again. Now, there's a lot of speculation that they're going to be meeting again because more indictments are going to be handed down against Donald Trump. But there's also speculation they're now going to go after Giuliani and the and what they refer to as unindicted co-conspirators in Donald Trump's uh, what, what do they call it? Uh, criminal fraud against the United States. So it looks like there's a there's a, there's a likelihood. I think it makes more sense they're going to go after those quote unquote co-conspirators. Uh, what they actually mean is Trump's lawyers. Mm-hmm. They're going to go after the people who gave Trump legal counsel. And this is a, a indicative of the expansion of the weaponization of government. Despite the fact that the Republicans are supposedly probing the weaponization of the DOJ, they are just ramping all of this up. But Tom, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what you think about this. What are they doing? Well, they're escalating. There's been no check. Uh, there's been no consequence for this abuse. Uh, for the Justice Department or the FBI or everyone else involved here. You have Democrats in Georgia about to indict Trump, it looks like. You have the Democrats in New York indict Trump. And and what they're trying to do is is freeze the Republican Party in the run-up to the election uh, by saying not only is the candidate and the former president, but people around him, the consultant class, your campaign lawyers, activists involved in advising you as to how to handle election disputes, they're subject to being thrown in jail if this indeed this is the case uh, that they end up getting um, indicted. And I think that's probably going to be true. You know, I, I testified to the grand jury back in February. They they sent the FBI knocking on our door, not my, my home, in November. And, you know, what did the Judicial Watch do? Well, we were out there publicly talking about how the Mar-a-Lago case was a sham since they changed their position on presidential records from the Clinton Soctor case that we have been involved in and changed it completely to go after Trump, came up with new rules. And so complete retaliation. And then they st- and then they spent three hours questioning me about emails and such about presidential electors. And I, you know, and I told them, I said, well, I don't understand what's going on here. Democrats challenged and had alternative slates of electors in 1960. So I guess it's different and, for Republicans. And Nixon chose to ignore the certified electors. Instead, he chose the Democrat alternate slate to be counted, and they were counted. Yeah, yeah. So, and on top of that, um, I told the grand jury, and the th- I had three prosecutors questioning me. So it was a triple team uh, on on me, and they were. Um, I, I told them that I, I was concerned in the summer of 2020 because I read about it in the New York Times that Democrats were planning uh, succession threats of secession and civil war if the electoral college went towards Trump. And I said, well, you know, of course, obviously that isn't going to be investigated by this Justice Department. And obvious, and what I saw from this from this grand jury experience that I had was I was in a political argument with these prosecutors about First Amendment protected activity. And I was just sitting there thinking, why am I being questioned about all this is a political debate? Why did they question you? Why did they call you in? I was harassment and retaliation. Judicial Watch is the number one. A litigator against the Justice Department. We criticized the Justice Department. We sued for records about their abuse of Trump. Uh, they know who we are. They know who I am. And we were the top voice in calling them out. And it drove them crazy. And of course, the big accusation was, well, Trump was listening to Tom Fitton. What, you know, it's just all, all sorts of, um, imagine if the head of the ACLU was called in because of the work he was doing at the ACLU. That's what they did to Judicial Watch. And of course, we don't get the protection and media support that the ACLU gets, but frankly, our work is more consequential. That's why the Justice Department was harassing and abusing us. So what I saw happen at that grand jury was abuse. And I'll tell you one quick story. Uh, so that at one point, the prosecutor said to me, so are you going to talk about this to anyone, what, what happened here? I said, I don't know. I said, it's, you know, I, mean, I have to talk to our lawyers, but that's privilege. 
are you going to talk about this to anyone? I said, I don't know. It's publicly out there. Are you going to talk about this to anyone? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, oh, by the way, I thought uh, you, you're, you're allowed to talk about it. And I said, you know, frankly, given your questions, it was pretty intimidating and chilling. So this guy was trying to get me to swear under oath to something I didn't have to do, which was to keep quiet on these, this abuse of power that I was facing. So oh, I, I, just saw, I saw this guy was trying to corner me into swearing under oath that I wasn't going to talk. So that was, in my view, outrageous prosecutorial abuse. I'm still ticked about it, and I hope the courts take care of it in the end. Uh, I really so don't I have think no so. surprise. They, I have no surprise. No surprise that Trump was indicted after what I saw there. And you know, the, the grand jury sitting there. I, I don't know. The what cultural divide in this country is is uh, unsalvageable, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the, the the judge in D.C. That you, right now they're trying to stop Trump from being able to speak during a political campaign while they use the case against him to campaign. The only you, way you, you look at this judge in, in Minnesota who is sentencing these cops to prison. These leftist judges don't care about what justice means. They don't care about fairness. They care about power. They're not judges. They're they, they're effectively uh, they're uh, occupying forces placed in these roles for the purpose of destroying anyone who opposes them. I mean, if the judges were honest. I don't know if honest is the right word. If I were a judge, I'd say, you know what? I'm not playing your game. You're trying to make me interfere in elections. I'm not going to do it. Your case is paused. You come back to me in November or December or January of next year. Then we'll talk about what we're going to do. But in the meantime, we're not going to use my courtroom to litigate the campaign. And I'm not going to start telling President Trump that he can't defend himself as Jack Smith made a, a political statement last week talking about how Trump was responsible for the overthrow, the attempted overthrow of the government and all the violence on Capitol Hill for which he wasn't even charged. Jack Smith should be the one on the dock Bingo. if yeah. the judges were acting appropriately Because he's, he said it, it was true. With, he, without, he didn't say allegedly. He just said the crime. He did the crime without the prosecutorial uh, due diligence. He, 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 well, I mean, I think that's a charitable way of putting it. Uh, but he came out and, and suggested that Trump was behind violence and he was promoting the indictment and you know as, as folks who are smarter about this have, have explained you know a prosecutor can't come out and say you know read the indictment that's the truth well that's not what a prosecutor does a prosecutor is supposed to say read the indictment and all the evidence behind it both inculpatory the stuff that makes the guy look bad and exculpatory and so to say anything else is infecting the jury pool so there's one man who infected the jury pool in my view that hasn't been held accountable, and that's Jack Smith. And of course, don't even get started in all the leaks that have been, I think, fairly attributed to the Justice Department of grand jury material. You know, the problem is for, I think, conservatives and even libertarians to, to a great degree, post-liberals, whatever this faction is, keep thinking we're playing a game of Monopoly and we got to roll the dice to see if we can get ahead. Meanwhile, they're just pulling bills out of the bank and doing whatever they want. Yeah, it's like exactly. a game of Monopoly where the goal of the game is to be the most popular person in the room. Doesn't matter if you win the board game. Well, that, you can that, stand up and flip the table and sing a song, and if everyone looks at you and starts clapping, you win. But that, that, that's that's I, I, I completely disagree. That's not even it. That's what this culture. You said the culture bifurcation you were talking about earlier. I agree. Yes. There's no way to but get one of those pieces to win. You need to create something new that is so but dynamically what I'm, what different. What I'm saying is. Imagine playing a board game where you keep playing by the rules and your opponent is cheating right in front of you, telling you they're going to cheat. They keep doing it and you just keep playing. Yeah. Sounds well, like those aren't really the rules. Well, and in the case of the Republicans on the Hill, they're funding it. Yeah. I mean, there's not a thing the Justice Department's doing that I'm complaining about that isn't getting funding plus by the Republican House uh, leadership. And so they have a decision over the next few months whether they're going to defund Jack Smith. They're not defund the censorship. They won't. But you know, but don't, but but don't let anyone tell you they can't do anything about what is going on yeah. with the attack on Trump. So Trump is going to get jailed, I think, potentially. There's a good chance that happens. Americans are being censored. All this other abuse is taken taking place with the full funding. And uh, by Republicans. Well, and they are saying, well, maybe legislation next year. But right now we're being hurt and they could shut it down tomorrow. But they're on vacation. There's a seven week. They're in a seven week, the middle of a seven week vacation. That is unconscionable for the American government to vacate for seven weeks at a time when you have the Internet. You guys get back to work. What in the hell? I'm 
Clint, you're about to say something awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say, um, you know, I don't, I don't actually get that upset with Jack Smith. Jack Smith is a hitman for the regime. That dude's doing his job. What I'm upset with are the the conservatives that have had an entire session in which they could have defanged and and defunded yeah, yeah. so much of this nonsense, and they opted not to. Where are they? They don't even want to impeach Biden. There's not enough evidence. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like the it's like MSNBC's running the Republican House Caucus in terms of being the, their fearfulness and proceeding with the impeachment inquiry against Biden. What would be the process if the Republicans were to defund this process? Like, what would that look like? Who would say what? How would it move forward? I mean, you would say the Justice Department can't spend any money prosecuting any presidential candidate. You could name the person. Um, you know, prior to whatever date there, you know, you know, there, there are scribes on the Hill that write the language out to prevent the funding of Jack Smith. They can actually defund people by name. So anyone who's been listed in terms of censoring Americans, they can be defunded. And uh, believe me, I've been raising this since Republicans came into power. And Congress can and, do and, this. Uh, go ahead. With, Congress can do this without, without the Senate. Without the president, they can just they do control this the purse. on their own, correct? The House has to be willing to go to the mat on this. Okay. And and by going to the mat is the, the Republicans aren't, the Senate isn't going to want to buy into this. Yeah. But they need the support of the House in order to keep the government funded. And so there's going to be a, a, a fight and probably the fall over whether to continue funding of the government because they won't get all the appropriations bills out and there'll be one gargantuan bill that has to be voted on in order to keep the government operating for either a month or whatever period they agree and only with the acquiescence of the house would that happen and so in order to get that acquiescence they could say this is what we want and if they're not willing to say that that just tells you where they stand on on these on this crisis we're facing this isn't a political debate when you're trying to jail a former president yep. and the current candidate you're you're kind of, you know, you're leaving the Constitution behind, practically speaking. And the test here is, you know, it, it wasn't like Trump did something. It's like, well, he robbed the bank. You know, we don't know what the law is there. You Here, they have these novel applications of the law, not only in New York, but in both cases against him in the federal government, certainly down in Georgia. And that tells you that they had him, they targeted him, and they tried to figure out how to jail him, you know, because they had picked him as a target. The documents shit was the worst, dude, because Biden had documents too. Like, let it alone. Yeah, Hillary alone. Clinton had documents. What the fuck? Well, and, and, and then Bill, also Bill Russian, in the Russian collusion. Yeah. And, and then uh, I think it was actually today or yesterday that you have the FBI agent that's now getting prosecuted for Russian yes. collusion. And he was the one that lied to get uh, the investigation started on Trump in the first place. It's Unreal. like everything they do. James Lindsay, Iron Law, uh, Iron Law Projection. projection <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah, did it's you incredible. see? Incredible. Uh, there was a tweet from like, was it the Secretary of State? No, it was. I was just like, is this satire? They were like, we, we condemn r the Russian behavior of silencing the opponent political oh, candidate. Right. Right, right. Was that Blinken? It was. Said yeah, that? It was. Yeah. And I was like, is this, is this satire? Because this is what they're doing to Donald Trump right now. It's the yep. exact same thing. Yep. What and an embarrassment. I, mean, I got to Because, you know, that. Putin and Xi look I at us and they must say, who, who are they kidding? America's different. And yeah. they, they pretend they're different. Putin recognizes what's going on with Trump. Xi recognizes what's mm -hmm. going on with Trump. Yeah. But they, we're, but, you know, the, the, you know, the idiot class that runs D.C., they <laughs> pretend there's a serious crime that's being right. charged here. Everyone else sees, well, the guy's, a, uh, he's arrested his political opponent. Uh, what else do you need? Well, and this this is what, you know, uh, Russia gets, or Putin gets dragged through the mud for, is exactly what's transpiring in America right now, which is going after your political opponents and jailing people for speech and reporting and all these other things. It's like, everything we blame Russia for, we're guilty of, if not worse. It's incredible. And, and Biden can shut it down. He's the president of the United States, and if he was honest and ethical, he said, you know what, guys, I, I don't care what crimes you've come up with. I'm not arresting my opponent. We're not prosecuting him. No. Yeah. And he's constitutionally enabled to do that, but instead we found out on the documents case that Biden White House intervened at key times to keep the case going against yeah. Trump and harassing him. So but when it comes to this arrest of Trump now twice by his administration, Biden is ultimately responsible. Well, and just a quick reminder, the second impeachment of Trump when he was the president was about the phone call to Ukraine where he was trying to dig up this dirt, which we now yeah. have pretty damn good evidence was all true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Trump Charisma, was a, Hunter. So, Trump so was it was asking, Blinken. I got the tweet here. He says, the U.S. Oh, strongly condemns Russia's conviction of opposition leader 
Alexei Navalny yeah, incredible. on politically motivated charges. The Kremlin cannot silence the truth. Navalny should be released. I was going to retweet that and be like, is this satire? But I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to be on their list. I'm already in that mindset where it's like, this is the uh, the enemy government. Oh, I do Ian, not like you're, this. You're, you're, on, on, their list, you're on the list. Like, you're I don't, on list. I don't think it obviously <laughs> I thought it was satire. I was like, is I knew it wasn't. I knew it was really political bullshit, but it was like, this is so ridiculous. This is what they're doing. I want to read that again. I got to I got to see this is from his political um account. It's not as personal. Well, account. I com I condemn the political charges against President Trump and Biden should uh, uh remove them as soon as possible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. He has every every um it, like it would do everything good for him if he did that cuz and and I think Republicans are failing here. I know I know he, there's a contested primary. I understand that you know, don't get in the way of a politician and his quest for higher office, but to me, the principal position for any candidate would be, uh, I, you know, I, I want to be president, but I, I don't want the uh, President Trump to be abused, and I stand against this. Well, yeah. Do you want to rule over the ashes of America? Like, is that really, is that a win? You no, know, I, you know, and, and unfortunately, not too many candidates have said that. I, fi I fixed this tweet for you guys. Oh, nice. I fixed it. So now it reads, the United States strongly condemns Biden's charges against opposition leader Donald Trump <laughs> on politically motivated charges. The White House cannot silence the truth. Trump's charges should be dropped. Now, this is fake, by the way. What I did was I just <laughs> right clicked it and hit inspect and then went into the and just changed yeah, it. Incredible. I, I, that's what I tweeted that. Condemns too, yeah. the conviction of opposition leader on politically motivated charges. The fucking secretary of state tweeted that out. That's blinking, Just, <laughs> you know, and it's I, and it's you know the first. I have to tell everyone it's the First Amendment, obviously free speech, free association. But the big aspect of the First Amendment that's being attacked here is you have a right to petition your government, Ian, and you should be able to criticize a government leader and ask the vice president, "Hey, what can you do to stop this election yeah. malfeasance?" And it's not a crime to do it, and that's what they're telling us now that it's a crime if you mm -hmm. ask the government the wrong question or make the wrong request no it, we're supposed to that's the purpose of this country that's it's exactly right the but ethos but, of this nation but is consider alter the government but consider that you were concerned about quote tweeting anthony blinken like, yeah, it's like i don't want to get involved no but i i get it that's my point though is like you're right to be concerned because we be. already know that they're I, I, our I, look i was reading my tweets to the grand jury quite happily because i thought they were great tweets <laughs> but it was outrageous that I was being harassed before a federal grand jury about my tweets about what the Justice yeah, Department was I wanna, doing. I want to point something out. I think my brother pointed this out to me. Uh, Anthony Blinken. All right. What's what's his first initial? A. Now, yeah. What's was, his last name? Chris. Blinken. Now say they say that. A. Blinken. Hey. A. <laughs> Blinken. It's not an accident. A. Blinken tweeted. <laughs> well, interesting. A. A. Blinken is going to lead us into a second civil war. <laughs> Fascinating. A. Oh, Blinken. that's funny. <laughs> But this is the perfect. Well, hold on, hold saying. on. We got news. We got news. We got news uh, from the New York Post. McCarthy demands Biden give us his bank statements as impeachment probe looms. Right. Okay, so we can get a, a little worked up, I guess, and be like, "Oh, look, he's going after as Biden's it, bank statements." But I just want to point out: Why is he only that, asking now for? Him? Well, it's it's because he's dropping grains of sand every week. Where it's like, "Oh, if if Joe Biden, if we find out that he's a little bit more corrupt than we already know he is." We might actually ask each other whether or not we should ask the government for the authority to ask for bank statements to maybe question an impeachment. The old phrase is boob bait for the bubbas. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah. What is that? McCarthy's it, not going to do kind anything. Of, you know, you kind of, as, as, he, as, as, uh, as Tim was pointing out, you have just a little bit to keep your, your base excited yeah. and motivated, but not do enough. And, and I, have to, I, I largely agree with Democrat critiques of Republican concerns about corruption. That it's a lot. A lot of it is political. They kind of want to use it to get some votes now and again, keep the other side on, on their heels. Uh, but when it comes to like accountability, they are fearful of it and they don't want to do it. Is and it so, and so here, this is uh, the danger. Here is for McCarthy and Republicans is that they just keep stringing this along. Everyone's going to see this as political. It, what you know? Stop. What you know? Fish or cut bait, guys. We don't need another hearing. We don't need another report. We don't need another email release. Judicial Watch can write reports. I can. I we release emails. What does Congress do? They can defund. They can make criminal referrals. They can impeach. McCarthy had any any guts? What he do right now is he say all these committees investigating? You know the House Oversight Committee, the Weaponization Committee, Judiciary Committee, the Homeland Security Committee. You're all part of the impeachment inquiry. Okay, and now we're all gearing towards impeachment. We're going to figure out who to impeach. 
uh, from, you know, lower level officials, you know, like, like Meyer Orcus, all the way up to the president of the United States. Just do it. That sounds glorious. You think that they They're don't They're not going to do any of that. I know, but it still sounds glorious. <laughs> well, they might, they might if someone, you know, I tell you, my understanding is House members are getting a lot of pushback on their failure to do what folks like Tom Fitton are suggesting. And so it's not like we're speaking into the wind here. There are many, many Republicans and conservatives in the base of the Republican Party and more than a few honest Democrats want something done about Biden corruption. And they're tired of this, what we're seeing here. Give us the, you know, engaging in performance fighting isn't going to so satisfy, is it, is, you know, we've been through this before time and time again. Is it donor driven? Is that why they don't want to go to the mat on this? That they, they would lose... There must be corporate interests that make them not want to go this route because I don't understand it otherwise. Because like their base would be jumping for joy, they would be yeah. reelected in a landslide. So they're probably they're they probably want to wait. They want to wait. They they're, want to wait till an election. Well, I, you know, I don't want to say that the, there's no political downside to doing this, and uh, you know, I, I would admit there might be. Yeah, but I mean, do they have a choice? I mean, what? Like, uh, I mean, can you can you not not impeach Biden at this point? Maybe, I don't see how you not do it. Maybe they're looking for like golden evidence before they push forward because no, no, if they no, want no. his bank statements they're looking for connections to Burisma and Hunter and then maybe that'll be they, a they hammer they didn't ask for the bank statements you know they spent the last six months and I think there was some smart activity there in that regard let's like, let's get to, not get to a fight with Hunter and Joe for his bank statements we can get all these other bank statements pretty easily and that's what they did <clears throat> and so now it's now August they're all on vacation and they're talking about well maybe we'll start asking for the Biden, uh, James, you know, Hunter Biden, or I don't know, I'm assuming Joe Biden's bank statements. I mean, I don't know what Joe Biden's bank statements are going to show. My guess is, you know, who's paying his contractor fees up in well, that, Delaware? I mean, no, he didn't, he doesn't pay any bills. No, that's Hunter was paying all the bills. They got to do more than bank statements. Hunter is the bag man. I want everyone to understand that. The money was being funneled through these corrupt business cutouts into Hunter's bank accounts, but then Hunter was responsible for taking care of all of the expenditures for the entire Biden family. That's the whole way they circumvented this, folks. It's like it's pretty obvious at this point if you've paid any attention at all. That's what they did. Biden doesn't ever touch the money. That's how he gets away with it. There's a crisis for the political system here in Washington, D.C., because they've known Biden's been corrupt since he's a senator. He's been in Washington 50 years. This is not a surprise to folks who serve with him and people around him. And the problem the political system has is now half the country believe him to be corrupt, too. So now they don't know what to do about it. Hence McCarthy's confusion about whether to support or not support an impeachment inquiry. And like if they ripped it open and he was super corrupt and then got impeached and had to step down, we'd have Kamala Harris as president. And like, is that are we even better off? Is that you yes. think that's going through people's heads? Yeah. If it's just if that's, the, you know, if justice results, if that's what justice results in, you know, that's the reality of it. And. I mean, just think about it, an impeachment inquiry. I mean, they're not, you know, they're still presuming to 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 say that, well, we don't know if we're going to impeach him or not. I mean, come on, well, guys. Because, because justice, it's like how, when do you put the brakes on justice? You know, you could rip the rip it open on Kamala Harris's bank records next. You can go into Willie Brown next. You could go into like her old text message. Like, how deep do you want to go to take out every new leader that steps in you because have, of some dumb corruption no, scandal? You actually, but it's not done though. I want to be very clear. This is not dumb. If if you are actually like, there's a really good chance that Russia doesn't invade if it's not for Biden's relationship with Burisma and the leadership, not to mention the State Department coup, not to mention Victoria Nuland. Like, there's a whole bunch of back history here that, yes, there's minor seemingly millions of dollars worth of corruption in terms of what they profited. But what does it mean in terms of the outcome for geopolitical dynamics? Like, we could end up in World War III because we were led by a corrupt president during this period. Yeah, because you're telling Russia and China, if you compromise our president, we're going to remove him from office or move to remove him. I mean, Burisma was a Russia-leading uh, uh, government um, entity. I mean, what I loved about that 1023, that FBI form that described uh, the head of Burisma's bribe scheme for the Bidens. So the FBI source goes and says, you know, we had the meeting and it was all in Russian. So Burisma was, you know, so between Russia uh, giving them money through the oligarch's wife, that was further confirmed last week. Who is that? What's the wife's name? Um, Maria, what's her it face? It was right? the mayor of Moscow's uh, ex-wife, I believe. Yeah, yeah. So it was like three, and you know, Devin Archer essentially confirmed they sent millions of dollars to their companies, and all of which they shared. 
Uh, and then Burisma, you have FBI Yelena. evidence. He gave ten million dollars. They they gave ten million dollars to the Bidens. And so, if you're Putin, uh, to your point, Clint, it, well, you, you're thinking, well, you know, I'm not going to invade Ukraine because Biden's on the tank, and I know he is because right. we compromised him. But certainly, that would be a factor, don't you think? That well, this, the country's not stable. Well, DC, you know, Biden can be con- he's compromised. He can be talked to. You know, he knows we know about him. Well, we had documents where during the Obama administration, uh, the Ukrainian ambassador was getting an email from her person just before Biden went to Ukraine in January of 2021, just mm-hmm. before Trump came in. And uh, the Russians started trolling him, literally trolling him in the newspapers. Well, keep in mind, too. Because of Burisma. And the, and the, amb- and the Obama's ambassador said... You know, was told, well, this is this is the Burisma is the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. So they knew that the Biden issue was compromising our national security wow. vis-a-vis Russia. Well, and, and keep in mind too, Hunter Biden was the lead envoy for the U.S. to Ukraine under Barack Obama's administration in 2014. When that coup happens, that's largely a State Department Victoria Nuland led uh, fiasco so like this this is a long running dynamic and people get caught up on like just this one 12 month or 18 month period of history it's very important that you understand the entire encompassing 20 year period or better yet go all the way back to 91 in the ussr and when the the wall fell and then the go back to afghanistan where the yeah. cia is funding the well, a lot of jihadin to to ruin well, the Russians quick, from quick within. Sh- my, quick shout out to my guy, Scott Horton. He's got a new book called Provoke that's coming out in like, I don't know, sometime. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. That's the whole reason I know about all this history. He's been incredible. On Mike it. Flynn was indicted by the Justice Department, General Flynn, for not registering as a foreign agent because he worked for a Turkish nonprofit, not the Turkish government, a Turkish nonprofit closely linked to the government. Now, there's even more significant and powerful evidence that Joe Biden is an unregistered foreign agent mm. vis-a-vis the Chinese and the Russians. Yep. You know, if, if it's good, enough, if it, you know, Trump should have done more. It's like when you look at it, it seems so overwhelming and like, what in the hell these pieces? But when you look at it in the future, when you look back on it, it will make perfect sense. Well, here's the problem, too. The reason and I asked him earlier, why are they not? pursuing the defunding of all this why are they not pursuing this investigation as they should my opinion is that both sides of the aisle are comparably dirty when it comes to ukraine in particular they they were i mean you have lindsey have you Graham, chris christie yeah well, chris christie but he said li- his audience supports his efforts on his, his his views on ukraine and thinks we're not doing enough yeah it's nonsense i don't know anybody on the gop side that actually feels that way but you have lindsey graham you have uh you have john mccain that are over in ukraine in 2018 going next year is the year of offense i mean this is a long running thing man and it's both sides of the aisle that were like they were cha-chinging you got mitt romney you got nancy pelosi they're all making money off this crap so if question for you guys if the United States pivots and is like, you know, we're going to settle this war peacetime. We're giving, we're seeding, we're going to sell Eastern Donbass to the Russians for $350 trillion or whatever the hell. <laughs> it's going to go to the bank. It's going to pay for reconstruction. The Russians will pay for it. The Russians say yes, if that happens. Yes. Will they stop there? Will, will they go for, for Turkey? Will they try and seize Istanbul so that they have a, a trade route into the Mediterranean? Or are we good to go? Did we just appease Hitler for the second time? Or is this actually peace? <laughs> I think it's over at that point. I honestly do. That's my honest opinion. Yeah, I think if 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 the war settles with the Russians keeping a little bit of Ukraine and Crimea, that will probably, you know, there'll be a tense, you know, a tense peace for a decade. And frankly, it depends on the Western leadership. I mean, the Russians are, you know, they will push where they think they can push. And if they don't think they can get anywhere, they won't. Right. Uh, with everything going on in terms of the weaponization of government, People being arrested, crime, uh, people just running rampant in these cities. At what point, you know, when we look back at history, there are periods where people fled their country because of the turmoil. At what point do you guys think we could we could reach? Is it, Are we already at the point where a sane and sober person says it is not safe to be in this country? Or are we still a few years away from potentially reaching that point like Crystal Knocked or something. A lot of wealthy people have already started to split, if I understand correctly. From big cities. Yeah. Well, and, and the U.S. No, right? I was going to say, and the, and the billionaires. So, so it's the upper class are leaving places yeah. like New York. The billionaires are building bunkers. But I'm thinking about, uh, you know, Crystal Knocked, right? World, uh, World War II era Germany. The or night of Nazi, broken Nazi glass. Right. They, they went around and smashed up all these Jewish businesses. 
And everyone's on the left, you know, Godwin's law, everyone's always trying to uh, compare everything to Nazi Germany. But you can look at a bunch of other uh, historical examples of mass unrest, pre-breakout of revolution or civil war. In the instance of Weimar Germany, uh, into Nazi Germany, it wasn't necessarily a civil war. It was just this cultural revolution that took place over the, over the period of several years. And with, with other countries, it was overt revolution. So when it comes to Nazi Germany, you had people fleeing well before the, the Nazis rose to power because these people were like, we could see it happening. In other countries, you had outright civil war and revolution break out with extreme violence in the streets and people were fleeing. Now, I understand in Weimar Germany, there was violence in the streets, there were street battles. But I'm wondering what you think about the United States. Will there, is, is it possible that ever comes a time where people say it's not safe to be here anymore? I, I, think, I, I think it depends on whether the institutions, uh, it's going to be a race, right? The, the left is trying to destroy the institutions of our republic, right? And uh, either take them over completely and, and, and change them, their, their basic character to make them anti-constitutional or post-constitutional. And the question is, will the American voter beat them to it and get them out of power uh, so that uh, same people come back in and restore and reform yes. those institutions? And is that possible? And, and um, you know what? I think it's possible. You know, my view is, I mean, you know, imagine if just there was a different House speaker in the beginning of the Trump administration other than Je uh, Ryan. All right. Or so, someone who was, you know, more House Freedom Caucusy. Right. Or, 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 or someone, uh, you, know, a, you know, a different president or a different Republican leader. To me, what's frustrating and both hopeful at the same time is it doesn't take a lot yeah. to get this reform through. Uh, but... Um, it's so frustrating because it's still not getting done, even though it doesn't take a lot to get this reform through. Well, let, let me say definitively, yes, there is a point at which that could be the case. For me, the two uh, demarcation points would be either uh, abolition of the Second Amendment broadly. That would be like, got to go. You got to well, Where would you go? Somewhere where I could not, not have to deal with the federal government. But I mean, they are the empire, so it's kind of hard to go anywhere and be any better off ultimately. But I would still probably leave. And then the second one would be uh, packing the Supreme Court. If they if they opt for that, that's really like the last line of defense. Thank God. That's the best thing about Trump's presidency. I've said it a thousand times. The Supreme Court justices he put up there, like if it weren't for them, I don't think that the, the vaccine mandate from Biden gets overturned. Like there's a bunch of things that don't get overturned if it's but, not for Trump's presidency. But let's, 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 let's dig into that. You're saying that not even a direct threat to you, if the institution is attacked, and gun rights are gone, and the Supreme Court is packed, that's enough for you to be like, we got to get out of here. I think so. What do you guys think? I don't think there's anywhere to go. I think- it, I El think Salvador? That, uh, I, I don't no, think the left, so. The left is running things down, down south. I think that, I think it, if the U.S. were to be in a situation where like the U.S. falls or whatever, like in a woods is where you're going. Like yeah. it's, it's head out to the Rockies, get into the mountains and live like the Wolverines. I know, know a lot of Bitcoin people. My buddy Jethro just moved to uh, El Salvador though. I like, <clears throat> I know it's, it, there's a, a very big tendency to just to believe that America is the freest place on earth. And I think historically that's true. I'm not so sure it is right now. I'm not so sure. It, they've really fumbled this technocratic evolution thing. Yeah, like it's gone too far. And but we got to remember the concept of uniting states is where it's at. It doesn't have to be here on this continent. It's just a concept. It's an idea of delocalized authority that can remain even if some states want to bail or or fail. Um, but I think that the, the, the states uniting is the way of the future. We'll have probably a Earth of states united at some point. And then Mars. That sounds like a one world government. Even, like even, satellite, like, <laughs> even the satellite station where people <laughs> sorry, will become sorry, its own state. Sorry, Elon. Well, it's it's We're just an extrapolation of, of liberal democracy or yeah. de democratic republic, but it'll be a global tyranny instead of a local tyranny no thank Wait, you it's over. that's well, exactly I mean, you know, what we're trying to avoid <laughs> well they want top-down authority yeah, I, they want a centrally controlled globe i want yeah. decentralized controlled globe i mean this is that's the whole thing more, about the ai that's stuff. what nations provide nations that have sovereign power over themselves provide decentralized authority you can work together as nations but you're not under one global the authority. nation is a step of the of the delocalization so you have you have cities then you have states then you have well, let's just go provinces, bold. Or, yeah, yeah, provinces sure. uh, but, nations. Then you have globes, planets, and then you'll have solar systems, and then you'll have galaxies. Oh, okay. And but we got to we got to rule ourselves from the local level. Yeah, yeah, right. And I and I think you know I appreciate your point earlier, Tim, about you know people want to be able to eat, 
But public safety is a pretty big deal. So and, sec and, security and, is a factor. And, and, and I think at the local level, these public safety issues eventually, um, even, I mean, even the mayor of D.C. is becoming a, a law and order mayor. Yeah. Uh, you know, the really immigration you know, mayors uh, in New York and Chicago. You, you know, the, the problem is that a lot of the big cities have, um, you know, they've, they've, they've put uh, their, the Democrats have put their political base, they don't care. They think their votes can be taken for granted and they don't respond to their concerns about public safety. But here in D.C., you get Democrat politicians who are concerned about their personal safety. Things change in a minute. And uh, so I think the public safety issue could be a, a, a significant cutting edge issue to get back control of the government from the radical extremists that are trying to destroy definitely our institutions. Sean, uh, I am or Sean, uh, I forget what his last actual name is. justice warrior. Yeah, actual yeah, justice dude. warrior. He has that. He makes this point that that crime drives poverty, but poverty doesn't drive drive crime, which yeah. I think is is pretty astute. Like if you have a an area that has a lot of crime, then you're not going to have investment. You don't have anybody that wants to go in. And and as much as people on the left hate gentrification, gentrification does help the economies of, of, of you know, areas and stuff. So if you've got, like the first thing you have to do is stop the crime. You have to get people to stop breaking the law. And as long as you've got people, as long as your, your DAs aren't putting people in jail for looting, then you're not going to have oh, it's, any kind of investment and you're going to have companies fleeing like what's going on in mul multiple major well, it's, cities. It's even worse than that, Phil. It's not just put, not putting uh, you know violent criminals away. It's putting away good Samaritans. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Know, it's like, yes. It's awful. It's the exact inverse of what you should be doing. Absolutely. Point and we're all supposed to forget about the poor guy up in New York who yeah. you know, yeah. rescued, yeah. rescued yeah. all those folks on the Wrestled subway. that homeless. Well, now you've got, 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 got the guys in California who are yeah. uh, the 7-Eleven workers. The, Sikhs or whatever. the guy Rick. threatens to kill them, so they... They beat they, him up. They beat him up. Now they're now they're being investigated for assault. Yeah. Oh my! The dude, well, hold out did, some kind of weapon. But they they beat on him for a while. And he had a weapon on him. Did he? So it yeah, he pulled out some kind of weapon awesome. and threatened them. If he brandished a death. weapon. That's yep. not assault. You got to beat him into submission at that point. And then or at least if, stop the threat. And all they had was a stick. If they stopped, does he get up and just start stabbing them exactly. or shooting them? Who knows? For Apparently, he threatened to shoot these guys. So what can they do other than try to incapacitate them? He was also, Otherwise, they'll get shot. Yeah. And if they had a gun, shooting them would have been probably been legally easier. Not in uh, California. Yeah, well, they I mean, the prison already. Uh, for the record, actual justice warrior is Sean Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, that's it, yes. Love you, Sean. He's great. Yeah, he is, he's really, really he's smart great. and funny. I love dude. his videos. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question, Tim. If, if there's a point, I mean, obviously, if the Bill of Rights starts to become overturned. I, 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 I think this idea of, like, institutional limits, I'm, I'm, I'm not as concerned. I mean, obviously, if the Second Amendment goes away, it's very, very bad. But that 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 precipitates the point of no that 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 is that is before. I, I guess what what I mean to say is, when we're we're looking at them right now, arresting their political opponents. Yeah, that's the test. I mean, I I think the Trump thing is the big test these <clears throat> days. If, if they go I, after, it's really disturbing. So so Trump is the point where it's like okay, it's getting dark. This is their political rival now. If they, now if they do indict Giuliani, I gotta say I think that's the point where historically. Many people said they fled the country because going after an attorney who was advising someone shows that you have a regime. You no longer have a government That's and right. that they will come for anyone who expresses discontent. I already so, feel that way. And you have the state, the, these poor. But I'm talking about speech like right, right, right. Giuliani talking to Trump. If they do indict him, then you're next. Media personalities, commentators, people on Twitter, they'll come after. They already had you, Tom, in front of a grand jury. Knocking you're, you're, at my door and, at and, my home, they sent the FBI to the home to the home of the head of the country's largest government watchdog organization. I got to be honest. This is that's intimidation. when when that is when you when you it's read really, history, it's retaliation. I think, I think we are past the point. I do too. Where, where you already have families being like, well, actually, I heard something interesting. People leaving, people who migrated here, saying they're going back to their home countries and oh, things wow. like yeah. that. I met a guy from El Salvador. And he said he was returning back home because it's safer there than here now. I don't know. If, I really think what you're describing is already going on. It's just that the United States being the or, being organized the way that it is with multiple states in one federal jurisdiction. That's why you see people leaving California and, and people that are, you know, leaving. There are people, I'm sure, leaving red states, although I'm sure there's yeah. far stupid, fewer. Stupid people. But, yeah. but there are people that are, you know, <laughs> we are organizing and segregating ourselves by our political opinions more 
more, you know, every, as every day goes on, that's, there are more and more people that do that. That's why they want to ban cars. <laughs> well, you know. And, and have us all live in 15-minute cities, cities yeah. slash gulags. You ain't lying. When, when we look back at history, we ask ourselves, like, how could it get so bad? How did it get so bad in Germany? How did it go from one point right. to the other? And the issue is that these things happen slowly, one step at a time over long periods of time. The American Revolution was a 20-year period. It's not like the crown said a bunch of nasty things and then we were like, you know what? We're going to declare independence. And a lot of people, we, we, we talked about this. When did we actually gain our independence? It wasn't until years after 1776. Right. What was it? Like a 1781 or something like that? Or 83? 1789 is when, the, is when the, the Constitution, Constitution was ratified. 83, I think, was the Treaty of Paris. Okay. So... There's a, there's a right. reason that the republics haven't been around for a long time. Yeah. And we're running into it. I'm but less so, concerned so, about turning into Germany, Tim, than, the turn, than turning Soviet into Union. Canada. Well, my point yeah. is this. Fortunately, we don't have a king. If, if they criminally charge Giuliani, Sidney Powell, or anyone else. John was, Eastman. Yeah, John Eastman. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Clark, is that his name as well? Jeffrey Clark, a Justice Department attorney who was right. giving advice and counsel to the President Unreal. of the United States. And they're calling them co-conspirators yep. and the grand jury is convening. If any of these individuals are indicted, you are past the point of no return. This is where the federal government is not going after its po political opponents is bad enough. But going after counsel is when the government is expressly stating anyone who speaks against us or tries in any way to form a legal argument against us, which is yeah. free and fair, yeah. you will be locked up. Yeah. There's the First Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, which is the right to counsel. I, I go back, I think, to that Duke prosecutor who went after those players fraudulently mm -hmm. on rape. And he was eventually disbarred. I don't know if he was criminally prosecuted or not. But, I mean, if justice prevails here, you know, Alvin Bragg gets disbarred. Jack Smith gets disbarred and subject to investigation over this abuse of power. And what they're literally accusing Trump of, of doing, which is, you know, misusing his powers as a government official in That's a, in a legal doing. way to suppress <laughs> the civil rights of American citizens. It's literally what Jack Smith did to <laughs> exactly. me. Exactly. It's what they always you do. You know, so, you know, arrest thyself, Jack Smith. They well, don't care. They, they, don't, they don't care that you're saying this. They don't care that we feel this way. No. In fact, they're probably laughing, it's saying, hey, guys, we're winning. economics, man. I, it goes back to the Federal Reserve formation to me, that co-op by John Rockefeller and his buddies. J.P. Morgan was involved. Paul Warburg was involved. They they got on a, went to an island, Jekyll Island, over Christmas when Congress wasn't even in session. And they like a, a skeleton crew signed this dumb this dumbass bank into law, this proprietary bank. They sold us out in 1913. Now the curtain is pulled back. But this has started 100 years ago. Yep. It, and and the inflation and from then it's ninety nine percent of the value of the dollar. Go so on. so like I want control from these and I like what you saying earlier, Tom. We none of the politicians weren't econ economic people, so they didn't understand how to do economics. They're like, fine, yes, give it to bankers. Right. Bankers will know how to handle the economy better than I do because I'm a Harvard grad or whatever. Um, but they they failed. The and the private bank has gone rogue. And they work out of Switzerland through the Bank for International Settlements. I don't know if there is a revolution. It is from the pri private banks. I don't know how exactly to do that, uh, short of like telling everyone pull your money out of the well, bank it's Bitcoin. and give them a date that, and a time. A lot, a lot of people say, but it's you Bitcoin. could you could crash the banks intentionally. I think that is economic terrorism personally, and I haven't gone pointed people down that road. That's one way. But I, if you're going to remove the system, you need to put something better in place of it. Yeah, I think the result is going to be just a sad shadow, a sad. The United States will be a sad shadow of its former self, where the liberties that our fathers and forefathers, you know, grandfathers, I guess, took for advantage, you know, took, for, you know, took for, you know, they took thought that, advantage. yeah, and, and it's not going to be available to us anymore. But will it be demonized for the few, because what would happen is, yep. they, well, that's what they're not, doing. They're tearing down statues of, you know, you, you, you know, they're, they're, they're for the radical left, they always have to be tearing down something. So, you know, you, you're never... You're never radical enough. That's why you always have to be deconstructing and raising your consciousness. Yes, it's that's, a perpetual process. That's the critical consciousness process. But let me let me take the inversion of this or the inverse of this and just say I think that ultimately there there is a tremendous awakening amongst uh, young young men, particularly in this country, as to what they've been up against. And I'm I'm far more hopeful that we have seen the worst days or close to the worst days, like we're nearing the inflection point. So I don't think we're without hope. I really don't. We're going to go to Super Chats. So if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button? Smash that like button in memory of Roberto Jr. Oh. And head over to TimCast.com. Click join us. Become a member so that you can watch tonight's uncensored members only show, which will be at about 10 p.m. It's going to be a little, it's going to get a little conspiratorial. 
because uh, a second body, that's right, body was found at the Arizona State Capitol. And we can only speculate as to what's going on right now. And I'll leave it at that. And you want to watch the members only show. <laughs> I thought so, you were going to say a second body was found in the chicken coop. No, no. A second body was found in, at the Arizona State Capitol, which is a bit more serious as much as we love Roberto Jr. Yes. But now we will read your super chats. I'm not your buddy, guy, says... How can you coexist with people who at every chance will cheat, lie, manipulate, steal, abuse power, and do everything to undermine you, while also believing your existence is an obstacle to their power? You can't, and therein lies the great cultural problem. I don't know. You need to get them to look at what you're looking at, and you need to get them to stand behind you and do your right a little bit. But So there is a form of unity and metallic bonding, and that you need to correct their focus onto something else that you want them to focus on. And All right. Want- Joshua029 says, rest in peace. Crying emoji and uh, chicken head, and then says, Rip Young King. Thank oh. you for the super chats, good sir. Coldy Locks Production says, Tim, I have to disagree with something you said about small towns earlier. You said rioting and stuff still happens in small towns. The stuff reported in media is the exception, not the rule. Small towns take care of their own. They certainly do. But when the George Floyd riots happened, there were riots across all of these small towns, and people's lives were destroyed. It, it, it happened. There have been small towns where the far left has tried showing up and you see videos of these dudes like pushing them out. Yeah. Small town I'm from never. There's never any problems like that. I think it, it get, the ones that do get hit, it's, they get publicized. But for the most part, small town community is where it's at. Being in a rural and suburban community is not going to protect you from the communists. No, no. That's where they're going to go first. Ask, ask the Cambodians <clears throat> how that worked. All right. K, uh, Keel, that he said, says, I'm super chatting to ask if Cast Brew would be putting out a cold brew kit. I'm an original TimCast member and really appreciate the work that the TimCast crew is doing in fighting the culture war. Uh, we want to actually do bottled cold brew. It's just expensive to do. You have to order very, very, very large sums. They have a shelf life. I don't know if we could move the, the volume we need to justify. I think right now, if we wanted to do cold brew, it would be like $4 per can. And then it's like, what do we sell it for? Cost, just so we can have mm. it, plus shipping. It's 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 pretty it's pretty expensive. Twenty bucks for four what's, of them. Yeah, what's the shelf expensive. life? One year. One year. Yeah. So it's like, what do we do? You, you have to to get the price down. You got to order a lot. Make tens the of can thousands. like bronze. So you need to make a Doesn't year. Matter. You essentially need to make a more. year's bet, right? Yep. We're, we need. To, well, we need. So a year's bet of sales. Right? No. No. We need nobody. I, I'm. I'm. We don't want to sell. 10 month old coffee on the verge of expiring we want to sell coffee that's fresh ready to go and which means we even if we went for the we can probably move all this before it expires and so some people will buy cans that have like two weeks left maybe they're fine with it because not ordering that much we get the cost down to three bucks we're ordering what a hundred thousand i don't think we move that much cold brew yeah yeah. it's tough it's tough i was looking for a good low acidity coffee and turns out cold brew is low acidity yeah what 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 you need to do something like this is to get a pre-existing contract with a chain of say gas stations or something where they're like yeah we'll order you know ten thousand cans to stock at all of our gas stations every month or whatever and see how it goes Maybe you can get it in some supermarkets, but... Oh, okay. So get the pre-orders in, get the markup already set. Well, you so go you to a chain of have. stores, they have like 15 supermarkets, and they say, we'll have, you know, we'll order 2,000 cans, you know, every month. And it's like, oh, okay, now we can justify larger purchases. Now we can justify putting it on our website. Now we can justify shipping and the cost and all that. But for the time being, the amount of sales we do, we cannot justify actual cold brew cans. That's why we just, we, we have, we have, but cake cups are coming. Where are we at? We got some more Super Chats. Anonymous Smith says, as someone who leans more libertarian and a gamer, I was wondering if you've considered sponsoring a group of gamers that stream on Rumble. Tim could also play Horizon on stream. I play, uh, I might consider playing like Overwatch or something. What about Baldur's Gate 3? I don't play that. Man, I just started it. Just started it. I just, it's it's daunting to go down that road because it's a hundred hours, you know, of my life and I don't want to do it alone. Dude, I'm a level 75 on Diablo. I'm, I've. You beast, what class? Uh, what's, uh. Not wizard. What's the other sorcerer? One? Yeah, sorcerer. Yeah, me too. What's your specialization? Ice shards. Oh, me too. <laughs> They're nasty, dude. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I knew. I knew Ian was my my Diablo <laughs> <Your> brethren, <laughs> yeah, dude. Freeze and vulnerable, baby. <laughs> Ian's your doppelganger. <laughs> I didn't want to derail because Tim. I think a streaming show would be badass, even if it's <laughs> going video game. Yeah, thirty minutes. Well, we a week. we've been working on it, but yeah, just, we should. But don't the gas. There's a bunch of things we're working but on. But don't offer to give out PlayStation Fives in the middle of DC or something. We could do like a yeah. gaming channel where different people play different games on different days. Well, times. we I, I announced we were doing a That'd skate cool. event in DC with free skateboards. A couple hundred people showed up. It was a great time. We all went home. 
Like it was fun. We skated. Oh, imagine and that. Maybe we should do it again. Actually, it's warmer out now, and we'll get the crew to go it would down. Would be nice to... to do it on a warmer day. <laughs> yeah. What, what's uh, what, are, what are we looking at? And, and it's starting to cool off a little bit. Let's. Uh, September is the f- September and October are. What's going on this weekend? In DC. The twelfth. Do I have anything? Yeah, we have anything yeah, going on? August, it doesn't so get to, it, August is, I like August. Maybe it's maybe we'll all be in out. D.C. at Freedom can, Plaza this weekend. Deal. Yeah. Free Dome. Freedom Plaza in, in D.C. is a good skate spot. We'll go there and we'll do some <laughs> flippity flips and whatever. Waffle Sensei says, I will be buying a bag of Roberto's coffee now to pay my respects. I think Roberto Jr. might be the most famous chicken in the world. You made it, pal. That's, yeah, he had a, uh, uh, he had a 90 foot tall, 95 foot tall billboard in Times Square with just his big face on it and uh poor guy he had a heart attack and uh, when he when he when he croaks i immediately we're, we're googling like what happened and it's like roosters have heart attacks like it's a thing i'm, I'm they, serious i think yeah. he might have been the most famous chicken on earth that's Is pretty there cool a more famous chicken i don't know i can't think of any i don't know of a single other chicken with a name so yeah, there's i like think like Roberto horn, leghorn but he ain't real yeah <laughs> roberto roberto is going to take over you know, we're, so Roberto is at Cocktown. It's like Jack Dorsey coming which back to is, Twitter. You know, so we got we had to we're bringing back his dad, and Roberto is Roberto's uh, uh, what is he a year and a half older than him? You know, Beast. so how long, so how long do roasters? About live? a decade. Ten so years. Roberto Junior was was like the equivalent of a guy in his thirties. Yeah, super young. Tragically. They're really young, really young. You know, he was a nice guy, and uh, I we have no explanation for what happened. He's not scared of humans. I was wondering if maybe he's, he's he was been, lonely because he had been separated because he was spurring the women. It's only been a few days. Yeah. No, I yeah. like, it just, I guess it happens. But, you know, I was thinking like maybe he was scared, but he grew up around people. We, he's been carried all the time. He gets, like, they, he has no issues with people. He's not scared of anybody. Maybe, Roberto Jr. is, I mean, Roberto's more aggressive. Maybe the the water sound when she kicked it on. I don't no, know. We have, a, we have rain and running water all the time. Yeah, in, like, in a strange know. environment we're with water. He's been, he's been here have before. Have he grew up in here. Yeah. Yeah. He grew the, up in here. All the factors of like... I'll, I'll, I'll conduct Bro, there was, a request if you'd there like. There was no one downstairs. There was like three... There was like there was like five of us. He was with Kim. He was carried by Kim. He looked totally chill. It, no idea. It's been weighing heavy I, on his I heart. I want everyone to save their documents. When when he started... I delete no emails. I want to do an investigation. <laughs> oh, forensic. When, when Roberto Jr. first started crowing, he would collapse. So he's oh, very... okay. And we thought... Oh, so he wasn't healthy. He, right. Yeah. Oh, well, that's too bad. Yeah. When, he, was, he was one of the first chickens that we hatched. It was one of the first eggs, I think, that his mom was laying. Yeah, we had like seven, and we all thought they were all hens. The first... Right, that was, no, that was well, big boy. That was and then, that and then was Roberto. And then Roberto turned out to be a guy. That was Roberto, yeah. So then we incubated some of the eggs. His mom had a cancer, so Katarina was Roberto Junior's mom and had a, had a, had ovarian or like whatever cancer, chicken cancer, and just one day was dead. And then we got a, a, a necropsy, and they said very serious cancer. So you know, not a not a healthy rooster, unfortunately. But we tried. We tried. Good looking rooster. Luke, little Luke's doing good. Yeah, Lukester. He's yeah, he's he's been getting <laughs> Luke's with the ladies, you know. Luke's little Luke's gonna be a dead. You want that guy. But Roberto Jr. does have a bunch of kids. Dude, we so. should give Luke his own coffee. Little Jeez. Luke? Yeah. Well, chickens Roberto all. Jr. is maybe you're right. Man. Too many chickens. Let's grab some more super chats. Kenny Loggins says, Y'all live right in the Appalachian Trail. Ian, go on a spiritual journey out in the woods. Just a backpack and some religious texts for a few weeks. I've hiked the entire thing. I'll guide you if you want. Wow. I'm willing to bet awesome. that Sir Kenny Loggins did not do the entire thing. <laughs> because goes, it actually goes to um, Scandinavia. Wow. It's called the International Appalachian Trail. The, the the range of mountains actually goes through the water and then into Scotland and Scandinavian countries. So I am being a bit pedantic, but the people who are like, we've done the whole thing, they actually do international. The There's international an international route. light to it. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the ridge or whatever that created the mountains keeps going into Europe. It's crazy. Dang. My, my cousin just walked it the U.S. side. You get to Maine and then you're like, well, I guess I'm done. How long did it take him? I don't know. He he walked past us, like not literally, but through here. And I, I wasn't around. I didn't meet up with him. But I don't know how long it took. It's you know, I, 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 I'm just, people are asking about Roberto Jr. I, I just don't know what could have caused this. Everything had been fairly normal. You know, he'd been taking care of Chicken City. Yep. He was investigating the Clintons. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Roberto Jr. He was he was paddling on the <laughs> Yeah, he was on a paddleboard out in the water with the Obamas and 
We, took, right. we took a blood sample. It disappeared. I don't know what's going on. All right. We'll grab some more. Raymond Hurd says, shout out to Livingston, Half-Life on YouTube. You are made from stars to live a life you have never loved. You are made from scars to live a life to rise above. Ian. Okay. Was, that a, was that a message for me? I thought it was going to be for the chicken. I have no idea. That was nice. Something about, oh, that sounded cool. I want to read that. The again. Coco Nino says, Tim and gang, if you're coming to Alaska, you need to come to SE, mountains, water, fish, glaciers, West Virginia refu refugees only. Happy to help if you need info, especially Ian. He needs to get set straight. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm trying to read old super chats and hearing new ones. And it's so many chats. You know what I noticed about working out and eating more protein? I feel like I'm dumber, but that might be a good thing. <laughs> what? I feel like it, things are hazy and foggy and I'm like trying to pay attention. I think shit. you're just tired. Yeah. Maybe more fatigue. Yeah. 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 Fatigue. Yeah. I was like, am I going to be the dumb meathead on the show now? Because, <laughs> you know, when you, when you eat a lot and you're lifting and stuff, you, you, your blood rushes to your stomach to help digest. So that could be, it was especially it the first week. A, the first week was like fuzz, fuzzy. I was did like, you use that blender tum tumbler thing? I haven't used it yet. No. It's amazing. Oh, nice. What is it called? Like I, a vol Voltrix or I'll something? bring it in next time. So we got these stirring. protein shakers that has a little plastic blender on the bottom. And so you just mix in your protein drink and then press the button. It blends itself while you're like walking. And I do like yeah. fruit, like blackberries. So when all the seeds fall to the bottom, I can give it a little spin and mix them all in and then take a sip. So I don't get all seed at the, at the end, you know? Yeah. I know. All right. <laughs> you know what that? Jazan Heitman says, it may, maybe it's Jason. Tim, you talk about the U.S. Civil War and the French Revolution. Ever read about the Franco-Prussian War? France started with Napoleon III as emperor, then went to the Third Republic, then the French Commune, all in a year. Scary, too. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize there was more than one French Revolution. You had the French Revolution, then there was Emperor Napoleon. So, you know. There's a movie, well. uh, Ridley Scott's doing a movie with on Napoleon. Oh, that's going to be awesome. He wasn't short. That's a myth. Really? Yes. He had Imperial Guards, and Imperial Guards were always chosen to be massive dudes. Ah. So in these paintings, you have Napoleon with these really tall guys, and like, look how short he was, when in fact Napoleon was of average height. It was like British propaganda. Was he, what, yeah. five, five nine or so, I guess, right? No, he's five five. People were short back then. Okay. In, so in, so, so he I, wasn't short in terms of the population. He's short relative to us now. Right, right. But, but so he, had, he had Imperial Guards that were like six feet tall. Right. Yeah, so nice. in paintings... We have a we have an old barn house at Freedama Stand, and the ceilings are seven feet. You're walking through the doors, and like of average height, you're like ducking. It's crazy. Yeah, because yeah. people in the in like was it average height in like 1900, like five five for a guy. Yep. Yeah. That's crazy, right? I think it had to do with like the French feet being smaller than like English feet too. Then there's like some whole some whole situation with that too. You're saying that human beings were shorter because we had different words for height? <laughs> no, I think the measurement was just smaller in English, and so they're like, oh, he's much shorter. When in reality, yeah. they're using a different oh, measure. We, they were just translating it in a way that was yeah. fun. Yeah. I, I, so. I love how I British people weigh people by stones. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, they still do. Yeah, yeah. Yep. There's what? literally Stone. nothing <laughs> that the British do better than Americans. We can even like measure things better. They're just so backwards. What about ridiculous. scones? They do meat pies pretty well. <laughs> like they meat, can congeal meat pastries. Blood. They do <laughs> well. <laughs> That's they true. do. That's pretty gangster. Oh, one stone is fourteen pounds. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's grab some more. Schweck says John Adams defended the British soldiers who opened fire at the Boston Massacre. He did the most hated people in Massachusetts, but Adams let. Let made sure they had a fair trial. We have fallen so far. We have fallen so far. Yep. I want you know? that. That's like superhero quality. <clears throat> have you seen John, uh, Ian, have you seen the John Adams? Um, it was a, a mini series produced by HBO. No. It's very worth your time. I'm it's not fantastic. sure where you could get it, whether it be on. Uh, yeah, I think it's still on HBO. It's, you can it's probably great. dig it up if it's. Whoa. If it's it is broad. so, so good. Paul Giamatti is John Adams. Oh, and he good. does. He has an absolutely brilliant performance. It's All very, right. very, very worth your time. Adams, man. MT Pockets says, I'd love to see Tom McDonald on the cast, please. Tom McDonald is an open invite to come on whenever he wants, uh, but he's a busy fella, so he's doing his thing. Who's Tom McDonald? He is a rapper. Canadian he's a good dude. Yeah. yeah, he's got a lot of really great music where his, his songs are about things we like yeah. you know People and he's see. independent which is awesome because right. you really couldn't rap about what he does and be on a label like <laughs> you just couldn't do it people say the same thing about ronnie radke and again it's like he's he's pretty busy yeah callie gildenzoff says inflation didn't bring women into the workforce feminism did my college debt is why i'm working i hate it well why'd you go to college to get it's a cultural well the left promotes inflation the way they promoted feminism so same same origin Oh, what do we got here? 
One plays FDR. Victor FDR. Papadopoulos says, after everything you discussed tonight, the corruption and two-tier justice system, can any of you give me three good reasons not to back Putin and Xi Jinping to the hilt? Our leaders are beyond redemption. Oh, I can give you uh, yeah. some good reasons. One, you think it's bad here? At least Joe Biden likes living here. Putin doesn't even own property here as far as, well, he doesn't, he doesn't have to live here. You can count on Joe Biden at least not wanting you vaporized in nuclear hellfire because it would mean his neighborhood and his servants can't give him cheesecake. There's one. <laughs> Same for Xi Jinping. That's like the best reason. And I'll give you another good reason. Because we want to win in the United States. We want to restore that, that you know, shining city on the hill. We want to make sure that, that the rights enshrined by the founding fathers persist. You back them, you're basically throwing the Constitution in the toilet. Yeah, you want states' rights. You don't want to back the Russians and the, the communist Chinese because they don't value states' rights like the way we do. Yeah, when, I, when I'm critical towards- They're also not American. Yeah, well, let me just say real quick. When, I, when I'm critical towards the US, it is not that I'm saying the CCP or the Russian <laughs> oligarchy is where I want to be. My point is we are too similar to them. And that's not a right. good thing. We need to get further away. We need to differentiate ourselves by focusing on actual capitalism, getting away from ESG and central bank digital currency and surveillance and the Federal Reserve and central banking and inflation and all this other nonsense. That's I'm trying to not be them. I'm not saying they're good, though. All right. Where are we at? Sea Warrior says, can people sue these judges and prosecutors that are attempting to interfere in our elections? People is a, is, a, is a big word in this regard. Um, judges typically are immune from lawsuits, my understanding. Prosecutors, depending on the outcome of the case, can be sued, my understanding. All right, let's read some more. But Raymond who, who can sue? May, you know, it would be the, let's say standing. you're a defendant, you, you know, it's clear that there was corruption in your prosecution. Yeah. You know. Raymond G. Stanley Jr. says, I don't get why libertarians call out conservatives whom they can flight with Republicans when they can't even get voted into any office besides Rand. <laughs> oh, Ron and Rand, both fairly libertarian, and they got elected. There, there, there are, uh, would you say Thomas Massey is libertarian? For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's the vehicle. Libertarians just run as Republicans. Yeah. Massey's one of our, our best guys. Look, here's the truth. The best conservatives you got are all libertarians. So don't don't give me this. <laughs> that's true. You know, don't give me this, that all the libertarian ideology ain't, you ain't getting the elections. Yeah, we just we just put on the mask of the GOP, and then we get in there, and we, we uh, legislate like Ron Paul, and you love us. So we, just be one of us. We had it. We were joking about a bit earlier about political speed dating and it's like two liberals sit down and one guy's like i love black lives matter and the other the liberal woman is like me too and they get up and they walk out holding hands then the conservative sits down with another conservative and he's like i think jesus is our lord and savior and she goes i completely agree and they get up walk out holding hands and then the libertarian sit down and one libertarian says i do think we need borders so sorry, borders what <laughs> and they both start yelling at each other about who's you the real libertarian fight. you're not a real libertarian <laughs> exactly that's uh that's why none of us reproduce <laughs> <laughs> It's, and I hear here it is. I thought it was the autism. <laughs> All right, John H says I want to I, I want to I want to for Vivek vote for Vivek, but Trump needs to win so the practice of lawfare ends. Right now it is escalating. They will keep indicting until SCOTUS intervenes. Then Dems will say SCOTUS is illegitimate too. Yeah, but we're talking about a primary. You know, in 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 a primary, I think if Vivek were to win, I'm very confident a lot of our problems are solved. I'm not saying all. I'm not saying everyone. I'm not saying it's revolution overnight. I'm not saying Vivek's going to save the world or anything. I'm saying he will be effective in many ways. Massively. Watch Massively. his uh, watch his interview with Patrick Bet David from last week. It was a town hall, actually. The guy is fan. He is there's, ready to go to China and but, Xi Jinping but, and put him. But Trump's going to win the primary his, in his seat. There's there's one thing I want to say about Vivek Maybe. as opposed to Trump. Like, and this is I this is not trying to knock on Trump or anything, but I do feel like Trump went into being the president completely naive about what reality is and i feel like he got railroaded partly because of that naivete i mean there's there's definitely the power structure that exists is incredibly stacked against the president but the president i think that donald trump was really really naive thinking that yeah thinking that 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 people in washington would treat him like a you know like an, an another a president, president. yeah um <laughs> yeah. But I feel like Vivek is aware of what would happen. I feel like he's, you know, he wouldn't be going in. Now, I'm not saying that Donald Trump would go in not knowing any, you know, not not realizing that they've got, you know, his number as well. But I also think that Donald Trump has a problem finding the right people to appoint 
So I think that I, there's there's just a lot of things about Vivek that I that I think are actually better than Donald Trump. And I, I think the personnel issue is going to be a priority for whoever the Republican nominee I is, and God, presumably I hope they so. win. Jeez. So whether it be. I mean, it's likely to be President Trump. If with, on the with the RNC side. chair still winning, I have no faith in them. No, like the fact that she, what, what's her name, Rhonda, McDonald. Rhonda, whatever. I, yeah. Um, I, like after the after Donald Trump lost and the 2020 election, and she gets the position again. No faith. No faith. Rhonda McDaniel. McDaniel. That's it. I, what an embarrassment. I agree with your assessment as to Trump's, uh, you know, pitfalls in his first term. I think that the best ticket that they could possibly put up would be him with Vivek. And I know I've had Vivek on, and I love the guy, and I'm not trying to put him in the second uh, slot, but he would, he fills all of Trump's downfalls, like where he, he put up all these scumbags into every single department. Like Vivek is that guy. He's the guy that, that understands, he, he understands ESG and DEI and all this stuff. He can actually do the things where Trump couldn't figure it out. The vague could do that. One of the questions that D Patrick Bet David asked him is like, well, there's a criticism that now that Trump's going in for the second time, he knows about who to appoint, where he's made the mistake before, and you don't have any experience, Vivek. So how do you respond to that? And his response was a bit incoherent, I'll say. I think he, maybe he didn't say it right then and there, but that is one of his weaknesses. Is he doesn't know exactly how to avoid the, the pitfalls. Of DC, sure. But he's so smart and, and uh, a, like sensitive to how I, to be honest I, I don't know i can't speak to vivek on on personnel issues but he one point he was like you know trump's on his way out kind of he's old he's already his best years for him have been and have gone for vivek they're up and coming and and his future is bright and he wants he needs a better future because he has two young kids they're one and three so a president that needs a better future will create a a country that has a better future. A president that's on their way out and is just angry and pissed is going to turn the country into a country on its way out. And I mean, that is not what we want. You don't want a nominee. You don't want a presidential, a vice presidential candidate who's going to harm the ticket. Other than that, I don't think it matters. So, I mean, it's interesting politically who, who it is, but in terms of the operations of I, the White House, it, it's not going to make I think I'm in agreement with Tom. Like, I, I think that, like, just like you said, you don't want someone that hurts the ticket, but otherwise it doesn't really matter. I mean, Kamala Harris yeah. didn't, you know, we didn't She's give anything to, to the Biden uh, ticket. Look, so. you're, you guys are right historically. I'm just saying that there's, with Trump's experience now, knowing what scumbags were surrounding him, he can actually pair that with the how-to. Like, like he can actually just use Vivek as a as a guy who's a real resource. Like Kamala Harris isn't capable of doing any of these things. Vivek is a legit, capable half billionaire, thirty five year old or whatever. Thirty seven. Yeah, thirty seven. I mean, he's the like dude has the dude has crushed it at every single thing he's done. If Trump doesn't utilize him, that would be a mistake. He's also a pharmaceutical uh, CEO or was before yep. he started, so he knows the entire pharmaceutical industry inside and out. He knows about how they're how they're skimming off the top what they're doing wrong and how he wants picture. revenge oh dude he's ready yeah his his story of how he got started we, we talked about it, how he wrote the book woke activists came for him got board members to quit from his company started attacking him even though he he was giving into what they wanted yeah. yeah they wanted him to write a letter he said okay i'll write the letter he said the letter wasn't good enough he's like what do you want me to do people started resigning attacking him and then he was just like i'm dealing with this when, when i was so i'm like i like that yeah when i was first <laughs> deep diving esg when i had just started my show Woke Inc. by Vivek was one of the the first books I read on it that really like set me on this journey of understanding the high finance like Marxist takeover of our economy. Vivek played that role. This was long before the presidential campaign was even a you know glimmer in his eye. I, I'm very impressed with the guy. I really am. I'm wondering, um, should we give Roberto Jr. a Viking funeral? We Wait, have we have a pond hmm, at Damascus. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's decently large. And we can make a little a, a little pirate. Viking boat, yeah, dude. And that then put awesome. them on it. Put some sprinklers. And then we'll get a on. very very small bow and arrow, and we'll just go <laughs> right into it. <laughs> oh, that's nice. And then now, do you? I'll eat, be there. Do you eat the chickens? We have not yet. My brother doesn't want to eat them. I'm all for eating. You know, I'm just like we got too many. Let's eat them. But nobody wants to eat them. <laughs> so uh, what we may do. Is we're gonna, I think we're going to auction off some of them. I'm not suggesting you cook the bird, by the way. No, oh, I'm not Roberto. You're not going to eat them raw, Tom. Well, What's wrong with you, man? <laughs> what are you doing? What are you, Ozzy Osbourne? So for his age, uh, he probably he probably would taste very good. Chicken sushi. But uh, he's a rooster. So roosters are, are very tough. And typically to have like rooster, you want to uh, you want to boil them in a pressure cooker or something because they're tough, manly meat. Um, however, considering the way he died, 
You I, don't, I, you don't want to eat them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think the 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 heart attack would cause like what is it? You don't want to eat animals that have adrenaline sur- rushes or whatever yeah. like that. Oh, adrenochrome. Not, yeah. No, like <laughs> that's not, when, when you're hunting deer, for instance, true. oxidized adrenaline. You don't want the deer to be adrenaline rush. Yeah. It's the shirt. It's right? cortisol. It's the shirt that's I think a lot of it's cortisol. It's the same yeah. idea, isn't it? <laughs> um. So oh, I was out there eating chicken in front of the chickens. You guys ever do that? Just eat a piece of chicken That's while just... you're looking at them? It's crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've been care. reading Q drops all day. Bro, they <laughs> eat each other. <laughs> if, if a chicken dies in the coop, the other chickens might, will eat it. Yeah, they're brutal. Yeah. They're, they're brutal. like little dinosaurs, man. People, like, yeah, people say you know, they're I just want, birds I, evolved I, I, from dinosaurs. On a serious note, you know, the, these folks that get involved in conspiracy, they, we sell through government funding the fetal parts of aborted babies. There's a market uh, for it. So, you know, they, they get focused on that. Well, they're selling thymuses and skulls and of aborted unborn human beings. Unreal. And so that's why my, my, that's my chief thing with so-called conspiracy theories. It's the truth is often worse mm. than what they are distracted yeah, it's by. It's a misdirect. I got to read yeah. this. Jason Hutchinson, I didn't see the super chat till just now, but he sent it a half an hour ago. He said to fund a Viking funeral for the noble rooster. Oh, send a super uh, chat. Oh, Heck yeah. yeah. Well, I was thinking yeah. about it because I'm all about Viking funeral. Yep. Oh, and we have a pond at Freedomistan that it's big enough to, sure. to where we could easily put them on a little boat and just, you know. Like a little wooden raft with like a couple of two liters filled with some flammable material. <laughs> I wouldn't want to burn plastic. Yeah, I would want to actually carve a little boat. Can we put like some flammable material in like wood that will catch and like really create a nice blaze? Yeah, yeah, can little, we put like a propane fire? tank right underneath it? No, so the explosive <laughs> end of... <laughs> We don't want the fire to spread outside of the pond. All you need, you just get a couple little charcoals. (laughs) Smell delicious. On each end. (laughs) People are going to be drive by like, you guys having a barbecue? Nope. Viking funeral for our rooster. (laughs) We won't eat our chickens, but we will put them on fires. Roberto Jr. was hatched and raised by me and my girlfriend, Allison. And we raised him here in the house. And we would hold him. And he had lived in, he was in a little cage with his sister's. And then once they got decently big, we transferred them outside and let them live amongst their own kind. Was he out? He was always super chill and really relaxed around people. He was really nice. Yeah, he was great. Was he the one, was he down in Chicken City, but in like a little room or was he in another area? He was in Chicken City. He was in a little room. The way he screams, I did it before. (laughs) I think that's him. That's going to be rough not hearing that anymore. I love that. It was just like it would start strong and then it would. The last last thing I want to say is just to, to mention that point where. So, so when this happens and we're trying to resuscitate him, I walk back into the house and then I hear a bunch of weird squawking and then I came out and everyone's standing there and the chickens lined up and we're like yelling and we were there. I was like, what would you And like the chickens just all lined up, looked over. Yeah, it was yelling. spontaneous as all get out. It was amazing. It Dude, was really, it was really like touching and I don't even know Roberto it, that well, you know, there were a bunch of humans standing out there. So maybe that's why. But no, maybe they sensed it. No, we, we go it, out there all the time. But it was that like, was, it was like was a weird. 10 minute lag time before they just were like, all right. Now's the time. It was like his spirit was leaving and they're like, yeah. they're like, I thought he was alive still, man. I had hope. I, I got to not do we, that. We took an O2 canister and Kim put it in his beak and held it tight and pumped air into his lungs. They tried everything. But his heart was done. I mean, did, All you, right. did you get a video of doing that? No, no. Oh. We, we were more concerned with trying to save him and his, his, you know, his doodle, his waddle was changing purple and yeah. we, we tried. Man. It was a very somber moment. <laughs> All right, everybody, if you haven't already, would you kindly smash that like button? Subscribe to this channel. And if you do like the show, please consider sharing it with your friends because that's uh, how podcasts grow. Head over to TimCast.com because we've got this very interesting story about a second corpse found in the Arizona State Capitol. And we're going to get very, very conspiratorial. So that uncensored members only show will be up in a few minutes. Check it out. You can follow the show at Timcast IRL. You can follow me personally at Timcast on X. Where's my money, Elon? I didn't get paid. <laughs> Everyone else got paid. I had 175 million impressions on X. Where's my money, Elon? X apparently not going to give it to you. Tom, do you want to shout something out? <laughs> Yo. <laughs> X going to give it to you. Tim with bars. X going to give it to you. <laughs> Judicialwatch.org. Support Judicial Watch. Join our movement. Join our cause. I'm on X too, at Tom Fitton, of course, at Judicial Watch. They're coming after all of us, so support us. Clint Russell, Liberty Lockdown, at Liberty Lock Pod on X. I've never said that before. I'm accustomed to Twitter. Uh, but you are able to subscribe to me if you'd like to support my show. It is called Liberty Lockdown, and I will be having on the QAnon Shaman tomorrow. I will also be on with Shamer on his show tomorrow. And then a uh, couple days after that, I've got Max Blumenthal, who was supposed to debate RFK Jr. He's going to come on Liberty Lockdown. It's going to be incredible. And then next week, Dave Smith for episode 300. God bless America. Check out Tower Gang. I'm out of here. 
I am Phil Labonte. I am uh, Phil That Remains on Twitter. I'm Phil That Remains Official on Instagram. The band is All That Remains. We are All That Remains on Spotify, Apple Music, Pandora, and the YouTubes. Uh, Ian Crossland, I'm also on X, which makes me think of it. X is like a drug that Elon will produce in the future that's a pill you take. And he's like, are you on X? And that'll mean that the social network's in your brain. <laughs> Bro, X is ecstasy. Yeah. Oh, jeez. It's going to feel real good. I'm going to be double X. Hey, Tom. Always, thank you for the work you're doing, man. Oh, you're welcome. Incredible. Happy this, to do it. Yeah, this Glad is... to be able to do it because we can't do it in any other country other than the United States for all the yapping and complaining. God bless America. Awesome. Amen. All right, love you, man. Catch you later. I am still on Twitter. It's still Twitter on my phone. My name is Serge.com. I'm not going to say X. I'm not going to say it. You Good. guys can tell it's on my phone. I'm not going to say it. Uh, I'm not, like almost like 10,000 people, which is insane. I don't know why you guys follow me. I don't say anything useful. But I'm ready for this after show. Let's get to it, Tim. All right, everybody, we will see you all over at TimCast.com in a few minutes. Thanks for hanging out.